Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! Good morning, good Saturday. Today is the 12th of December 2020 and it's 9 a.m. UTC, which is 10 a.m. Italian time. I don't know your time zone, but good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Please stay awake. <laughs> I have to start with a couple of uh, apologies. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry if I have eye bags and I'm not in a perfect shape today because I don't know, maybe it's some meal that I ate yesterday, but I had a rough night. So I'll try to be still as energetic as possible, but I could have some defiances uh, from time to time. I hope not. Second apology, probably the intercom could buzz uh, at a certain time <laughs> and if it does I will probably mute my mic for uh, one minute for a couple of seconds and uh, and we'll still roll on so stick with me even if you hear buzzing sounds unexpected buzzing sounds and uh, well a third apology is that probably last lesson was really really hard because it, I went really really fast uh, this is because of uh, the fact that I wasn't planning to go so much in detail with uh, CSS because as a language it's not that difficult to understand. It, it requires a lot of practice, yeah, um, lots of practice is needed. But uh, I cannot just practice uh, during my lessons. I can show you some examples, but the practice is something that you should do by yourselves. So I hope that you have practice and you are going to practice a little more later on with the tools that I'm providing you. Um, another reason why I went so fast is that I received some feedback from uh, some of you guys, some of my students, and uh, some of you told me that I was going too slow. Uh, you wanted to see responsiveness, you wanted to see advanced stuff. So I, well, I welcomed this feedback and I tried to go a little fast. Then, after the lesson was over, I had another feedback from some other students that told me that I was going too fast. <laughs> so uh, that's not a problem. I need this kind of feedbacks so I can adapt the lesson to my audience. Hey, Sao, good morning. Good morning to you. So nice to see you. And um, so, today I will slow down again because also we are going to see some advanced concepts that I care to show you. And you requested me these concepts a lot. So, I'm going to go really, really slow and, and deep on these concepts. Uh, speaking of feedback, I received also very positive feedbacks recently. Uh, I reached this week 200 followers, which is amazing for me since this is a niche topic, uh, a niche subject, uh, but still, it means that uh, it's not just relatives and friends watching me. Probably there's also other people that are really interested and maybe are learning new things. I know that among you there are some former students of mine who want to just rehearse um, some concepts or just have pleasure in uh, sticking with me once again because they have um, you know, they have a good memory of the lessons that we did together and uh, that's awesome for me and uh, I welcome you, of course. It's so nice to see old and new friends sticking with me uh, during these lessons. Angela says, good morning. I think this is due to the different backgrounds and experience we as your students have, so it will be always be either too fast or too slow for different people. I think you're right and I will try to find the, the, the good mean um, the good balance between the going too fast and going too slow. I cannot go as slow as the slowest one because otherwise I, will, I would um, draw back everyone else. But I will try to find the, 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 proper, um, the proper pace so you guys will be challenged but not too much. Uh, keep in mind that I always want to... Let's go to the coding scene. I always want to put you in the learning zone, which is right upside of the comfort zone. Um, I don't know if you know this, probably yes, but there are so many zones in which you can be. Uh, let's take this image here, for example. And uh, so if you're in the comfort zone, you probably 
get bored quite easily. You are comfortable, but you get bored. If you're in the panic zone, it means that I went too fast, the concepts are too difficult, you didn't have time to practice, and when you panic, you just leave the course. Comfort zone and panic zones are the zones in which I don't want you to be. I want you to be right in the middle, in the learning zone, right outside of the comfort zone, but not too much, otherwise you'll panic. And if you, if you feel that you're too comfortable, please tell me. If you think that you're panicking, please tell me, because I would like to draw you back to this place in between, okay? Hi, Tiago, so nice to see you. Okay, so... Uh, we already wasted five minutes of your time, so let's move on. Um, last time we saw some CSS base, some CSS interme intermediate, and even all, almost all of the CSS advanced. Today I plan to rehearse a little some of the things that we already saw, um, move forward and finish the CSS advanced, and then we'll go beyond CSS, which is probably the most important part of the HTML CSS section. Then, I don't think we will do it during the, this lesson, but probably the next one, we will start finally with JavaScript, which is the subject that I care most about. Bobby says, I say you go hyperspeed and do a survival of the fittest zone. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> that could be uh, quite fun. Um, speaking of challenges outside of the comfort zone, I don't know how many of you uh, watched my latest stream, which was last Wednesday, but I tried to uh, sing a German reggae song uh, because it was suggested by one of my watchers of the Wednesday. And uh, given that I don't speak any German, it was quite a fun challenge because I tried as much as I could to mimic the sound of German words just like a parrot, without knowing the meaning. And it, it was pretty fun. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have much voice uh, last time. I will try again next Wednesday. So, speaking of CSS, we already said what CSS is about, and you know that the basic rule is just that every CSS rule is uh, you specify a selector, and then inside of curly braces, you specify properties with property name, colon, value, and then the semicolon to separate all these properties. Let's have a look at one of these rules, for example. Here it is. This is a CSS rule because it has a selector, in this case, this hash root. And then inside of braces, we've got some properties. And the properties are always written like this. It's a property name, column, and then property value. Um, this is one of the rules, this is another rule here, this is another rule which has exactly the same shape, but it also has some new stuff that I taught you really, really quickly last time. What are these things? Well, uh, some of them are um, special selectors, some of them are pseudo selectors, uh, some of them are special properties, property values, and uh, it's not enough to just show you these things. You have to try them yourselves. I am still learning a lot of these things, and I will probably show you a couple of uh, clever hacks that you can do once you know the basic rules. You know, just like in any game, you know the basics, and then you find strategies. You come up with new ways to use the same rules. And uh, you can become really, really creative if you're smart enough. I am not. In fact, I always copy some recipes from the web instead of, instead of coming up with my own recipes. Uh, you will see now. So, uh, we saw how a couple of selectors. We can select by type, by D, by class. And this is probably the most basic thing. This is a selector by type because I'm saying every link of type A, which will have a color of cornflower blue. But this is a selector by ID. Any element that has an ID, which is root, will have these rules applied. What is this ID? Well, it's something that you already saw uh, when dealing with forms. It's this thing here. It's an attribute that you can place to, in, into any element and that specifies that this div in particular is the root. And it's a unique identifier, that's why it's an ID. So you should, as much as you can, use uh, unique IDs for the whole document. 
But then we also have classes. So for example, this is a div of class picture, which means that in the page I could have multiple divs and I could have multiple divs of class picture because they are special divs that contain some picture. And here in the CSS, uh, I said that the picture should have a width of 80 pixels, a height of 80 pixels, a background which is pink, and it should float on the right. So these are also properties that I explained really, really fast last time. If I'm speaking too fast, remember that the recordings are on YouTube and you can slow down the recording. In fact, this is exactly what I did when learning the German song. It was too fast for me, so I had to slow it half the speed and listen carefully multiple times to the sound. Uh, if I'm speaking too slow, then you can just speed up. Um, okay, so as for colors, I already told you that colors can be RGB, in you know, HSL, you can name the colors just like cornflower blue, or you can even create gradients. And this is it for the basics. Then we saw other things like pseudo classes, pseudo classes or pseudo elements. Um, well, we, we saw them very, very quickly, but um, for example, if I remember correctly, this is a pseudo class, or a, I, I don't remember if it's a pseudo class or pseudo element. There's a slight difference between these two. Um, if you're curious, just Google it. Pseudo classes, pseudo elements. And uh, here it is. This guy here says that all these are pseudo classes, link, visited, hover, active, focus, etc. And there are some uh, pseudo elements which are the before, the after, the first letter and first line. Okay, uh, this makes sense because pseudo classes are special classes that apply to the current element. So this is always the A, it's the anchor link, but when I hover on it, so it's a special case for this anchor link. But then we also got some pseudo elements like the before, which I probably mentioned really, really fast. But the before is a special thing that allows you to create an element inside of the HTML, inside of the document, without specifying it in the HTML. It's kind of strange, but um, it just works. Let me just show you, for example, 03 CSS intermediate. Um, gonna create a new file. And I want to slow down on this too, because uh, one of you students told me, hey, how did you make the HTML file so quickly? Um, probably you missed some, uh, some parts of the lesson, and that's fine, I can rehearse it for you. So I created a folder in here, then I create a new file, and I usually name it index.html, or I can I don't know, I can use pseudo classes HTML if I want to give it a special topic. And then how do I write all that HTML5 boilerplate so fast? It's actually pretty easy because I can start typing HTML and Visual Studio Code will give me some suggestions. I can use this uh, HTML thing or with the arrow keys, I can select HTML5 or HTML XML. What we want is HTML5, which is the latest version of HTML, which is still a work in progress, still uh, expanding, but still, it's the latest one. So I can select HTML5 and boom, I've got all the boilerplate ready for me. Here, the document uh, title could be pseudo classes. And you already know that this doesn't show on the page. It shows just as the tab name, the tab label, right? And now I can, as always, uh, use CSS as a style tag here. It's not recommended. In fact, I already told you that I really highly recommend you to write your CSS in a separate CSS file. But it's so convenient for me to have different styles that apply only to their own documents while I'm teaching. So this is just for the sake of teaching you. I'm putting my CSS rules inside of this style tag, which should not even be in the body. It should be in the head because this style tag is not visible to the user. It uh, creates rules that are then visible to the user, but th still, style is some sort of meta information that I usually want to place in the head, not in the body. How did I place the style so easily from body to head? I'm using Alt 
arrow, up and down arrow keys. This is how I move things. I select a piece of code and then I use the alt and up and down arrow keys to move things around. So the body could have a div with an ID and uh, this element, I don't know, uh, let's call it root as always. This is the root of our document. And I created this just to create a CSS rule in here that allows me to specify some uh, properties, okay? So, I don't care about placing properties in the root. I care about placing properties in the before pseudo element of the root. What is this? Well, I'm specifying in CSS a new element that is placed as the first child of the root. In fact, let's also put a P, a paragraph, something, something. Okay, so this root according to the, oops, this uh, root element according to the HTML is saying that it, it just has one child, the paragraph. But when I specify root colon colon before, I'm actually saying that before any, chi uh, any children in this root, there is also another element that I'm specifying not in the HTML, but in the CSS section of my document. So here I can say that the content, oh, it's pretty hard to type when I have my microphone here. Uh, the content is a text content and I can say hello world, something like that. And I think that I can stop here for now and see what happens. So I'm going live with my live server. And here it is. So as you can see, we've got a div. You probably can't see it because it's too small. Okay, uh, we've got a div with an ID root. It has one child, which is the paragraph called something. But before that paragraph, we've got this colon colon before which I didn't add in the HTML. It was added through CSS. So as you can see, before has a content of hello world. And this seems pretty stupid. Why should I create new elements uh, inside of the CSS instead of inside of the HTML? Well, the only, the only reason I can tell you is that with this, you can create many useful hacks. And we will probably see one uh, in a while today. So don't overuse this thing. You usually see this uh, before pseudo class, pseudo element being used uh, by some libraries or frameworks. So they use it for you. You don't have to use them directly. But still, there's a fly here. <laughs> Come on, let me work. Um, but still, there is, you can do it by yourself. If you are curious and brave enough, you can try and use this uh, before pseudo element. And of course, there's also an after. So I can say root colon colon after. And you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use after and before. So it's uh, even more clear what is happening. So we've got a paragraph as a child of this root. But now, due to these two rules, the paragraph is sandwiched between two other elements, pseudo elements, that you can find in the HTML tree, like colon colon before and colon colon after, okay? And everything that you place in between will be sandwiched. Uh, something else. You see, the paragraphs are still there but the before comes before every child and the after comes after every child. Okay, so this is a uh, pseudo elements and pseudo classes that we saw last time. Um, you know about shorthand properties. In fact, there are some properties that you can explicitly state as, uh, for example, uh, when you want to place a border, when you want to place a border to the root, root, let me just write some good code. The root could have a border and the border has many properties. For example, it could have a border color, cornflower blue. It could have a border size, no, width, border width of uh, two pixel. Uh, it could have a border style such as, uh, yeah, dashed. And this should probably work, yeah. 
But I don't want to write three rules. I can write one rule using a shorthand property, which is border. Uh, with this shorthand property, I can just place multiple values together, like two pixels dashed corn flower blue. And this is exactly the same as the three properties here. In fact, if I now look at the roots and see all these properties, I can switch off these three properties and I can see that the border is still there because I used just a shorthand property. Okay, so there's many shorthand properties. You can use them, you can overuse them as much as you want. We also saw some things, uh, th something about backgrounds. Uh, in here too, we've got shorthand properties because you can specify background color or and or background image, the repeating of the image so it gets styled or not, the position where to start the background in the center, the top left, etc., etc. Or you can use the background shorthand properties uh, property that can just place all these properties together in the same line. We already told about specificity, which means that um, you can write things like any div should have a background of uh, corn silk, but the root, which is a special div, will have a background of, uh, I don't know, let's dark khaki, okay? So what this means is that every div in the page will have a background of corn silk, but this div in particular, since it has a special ID root, will override the rule that I just uh, created with the rule that he's got in the rule set. And this is about specificity, because every div has a low specificity, and div with a class have a higher specificity, and div with an ID has a really high specificity, so they will override any rule that is created, even below. So I'm saying that cascading style sheets usually um, are read and interpreted by the browser from top to bottom. So you could say that this background was read by the browser before this one, and it was overridden by this rule here just because it's written below. But this is not the case. Actually, if I place the div as the last rule here, it should happen that, yeah, nothing changed. Because it's not a matter of positioning the rules on top or at the bottom of the CSS uh, rule set, but it's about specificity. The root ID is more specific than the div. So I'm saying every div is corn silk, but the root is dark khaki. And there are some uh, numbers associated to this specificity, which probably you don't need to care too much about. But if you create a selector for an element, a tag, for example, div, that rule has a specificity of one. If you're using classes, the specificity is 10 times higher. And if you're using IDs, the specificity is 100 times higher. And I think... Look at that, when I hover on one selector, I will see the calculated specificity uh, here on the suggestion. You see, selector specificity is 101, which I don't really care about. Uh, let's, let's just not go too much in detail into, the, into this. I'm sorry. We have many kinds of displays, and I already told you that some elements have a special display. So, for example, um, the paragraph, the div, even the body probably, have a display of block. And a display of block means that all these elements try to take all the space available, uh, well, that was made available by their container, and uh, so anything that goes after these elements will probably be placed uh, below them. And this happens with paragraphs, in fact. Uh, a paragraph, as you can see, is wide as its container. And you can see here below that the browser, the user agent style sheet, already puts a display of block in, on the paragraph. But I can override this property and say that display is, for example, inline. Inline means that the paragraph will now be 
uh, as big as its content, not as its container. So as you can see, it's shrinked to the size of the something text that is written here. And the same goes with, no, the same doesn't go with something else because it, this something else still has um, the display of block. I have, to, I have to put display of inline here too. And now you can see that both these guys went into the same line because they, they are not spanning the whole width of their container. There's also an inline block that you can use. And inline block is uh, very similar But there's a small difference that I always, always forget. And when I forget it, I just go to Google and I find again what, it, what the difference was about. Compared to display in line, the major difference is that display in line block allows to set a width and a height on the element. Right, okay, let's try. For example, these two paragraphs now have a display of inline block. Will this mean that I can place a width, a width, uh, what if I say 100 pixels? Yep, this something paragraph now is 100 pixels wide. But what if I turn it into a display inline? Nope, the width has no effect now. And even the margins have no effect now. I see that the margins are not present here. So there is some difference between inline and inline blog which we should keep in mind as much as we can. Or, as uh, like I do, you can forget it and then find the answer again and again and again every time. Angelo says, do you happen to know how you can arrange the panels in browser Chrome below each other like you have it instead of next to each other? Uh, the panels, yeah, okay, so this developer tools has multiple panels in here. And if you shrink the browser like this, or if you shrink the panels, the developer tools, or you, or you widen it, you will see that the panels go uh, one below the other or one next to the other. This is, as far as I know, a property that cannot really be uh, arranged by you. I'm not really sure, but... Uh, Whenever I see things going this way and I don't like them, I just resize the developer tools so they automatically go this way. Um, I'm really sorry, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we, we can find it, we can find the answer later on. Um, but in the meantime, let's just play with it like this. Um, okay, so. So, in, uh, I was saying display inline, display block. There are some elements which already have these properties. In fact, um, another really important element that I just mentioned uh, last lesson was span. If I put else in a span, and I will probably refresh the browser so nothing, okay. Um, else is now inside of a span element. And as you can see, nothing really changes uh, from the user perspective. But now you've got this span, which is an element that has a default display of inline, and you can add whatever you want. For example, a font weight of bold, or even a text decoration of underline. So you can underline it. And you can use a font style of italic. So I'm putting random properties, random text properties on this span only, not on the whole paragraph, only on this span. So when I use spans, it's usually because I want to place particular styles to the text that is inside of that span. And um, so you can use strong, you can use um, M to emphasize the text, or you can use a span with a particular class that tells the, the CSS rule what to do with, the, with that class. Okay, um, what else, what else, what else? We've got other kinds of displays. So we've got display block, display inline. We've got display none, which sometimes is really useful because you want to hide content according to certain uh, conditions. And we will see some examples later on. And we also have a display table, which allows you to never use again the table element. Instead of using the table element, you can create a div with a display of table 
that contain some other divs with a display of table row, that contain other divs that have a display of table cell or a table header or something like that. Um, I don't encourage you to use display table in order to create table-like structures um, such as a complex layout with header, uh, footer, the main content in the center and navigation links in, on the sides. Mm, display table is not the right choice. Today I will show you other ways you can achieve the same results but with uh, a better code and even more responsive. So we talked about pseudo classes, these are pseudo elements and as you can see before and after, here are considered pseudo elements and that's true, yeah, they are pseudo elements. Uh, we also saw a little bit of page layout. We saw that we can position things relatively or absolutely. So if I place something with uh, absolute positioning, let's do this with uh, something. If I say that position is absolute, this paragraph is still there. But now I can say that from the top, it should be at zero. And from left, or let's say from right, it should be at zero. And now you can see that something is placed absolutely in the page on the top right. Or I can put it on the bottom right, maybe. As you can see, this absolute positioning takes into account the margins, which, okay, it's fine for me. <laughs> if you don't want to take into account margins, you can probably don't place any margin at all. You can override the margin by saying no margin for this element, margin zero. And now that something is placed exactly on the bottom right of the page. If you want to place it on the bottom right of its parent, the root, then the root should also have a position of relative. This is one of the recipes that you have to learn by heart and uh, they just work. When the parent of an absolutely positioned element has a position of relative, then the element that you want to position absolutely will be placed absolutely, but relative to its parent. And this is how it goes. I wouldn't rely too much on absolute positioning, especially if you want to be responsive, because as I already mentioned, if you start shrinking things, you will see bad things happening. So for example, texts will be overlapped. And you probably don't want on a mobile screen have something still positioned absolutely on the right. So pay attention. It's cool to have something positioned absolutely, but it's not probably the best thing you can do, especially when you're dealing with um, images. I probably showed you this one here. So I have to look at CSS. Let's go to 0, 2, CSS base, and then what was that? Positioning? Positioning. Here it is. So we created this example in which this picture, which is not even a picture, it's a div with a pink background. Uh, I wanted to place it on the top right of uh, this um, div that contains paragraphs. But instead of using the position absolute, I decided to use another property, which is float right. If I float right, the div will actually be positioned floating on the right, but with the extra feature that the text will not be overlapped with the picture, and instead it will adapt to the picture, as you can see, which is much better if you want to place pictures inside of your document. And what if you don't want your text to adapt to the picture? For example, starting from here, this lorem ipsum, etc., etc., I don't want this lorem ipsum to be here next to the picture and to adapt to the picture. I just want it to go below the picture and take all the available space. Well, in that case, I applied a class that I called clear fix because, well, it's for historical reasons. I know that uh, some frameworks use this term. So I just said clear fix. And as you can see, I just placed this property clear both, which allows to uh, not take into account the floating picture, which is uh, above it. If I remove clear both, you can see that this text is now going up and adapting to the picture. But if I now switch on clear both, then this text will say, okay, I'll place myself after the floating item and will span the whole width. 
And this is another cool recipe that you can borrow from me or from other frameworks that I'm going to show you today. Uh, and this is position, floating and clear. And this was everything that I had to say about the intermediate stuff. Now, for advanced stuff, I already showed you a showcase of all the different properties. And I know it's not really that fun. Uh, you want to try them yourselves and you want to see the effect of these things uh, applied to a beautiful website. But unfortunately, I don't have the time and probably I don't even have the skills to show you beautiful websites uh, live made with all these, um, all these elements together. In fact, if you create a, some sort of kitchen sink of all the different CSS properties, you will probably create some sort of Frankenstein which is not really good looking. So you have to learn these properties. You have to learn that they exist. And then as soon as you need them, you want to integrate them in your beautiful document, you remember the name and then you apply them. For example, how do I create rounded corners on my elements? You have to remember that the property is called border radius. And so you look for border radius CSS on Google and you find some documentation that tells you how to create border radius and you can even experiment yourselves. Okay, so the only thing that you need to know is that these properties exist and you have to remember at least their names and then you can use them where you want. We also played a, a little bit with box shadow, which adds a shadow. Um, well, yeah, it adds a shadow, I would say below the element, but it's not actually below because you can place the shadow on top of it or below or on the left, on the right or even uh, around it. Uh, you, you can create some sort of halo um, behind the element or it can be an inset box shadow which means that the shadow starts from the bounds of the element inwards instead of outwards. We also saw the advanced selectors so the asterisk says every element, the greater than symbol says all the direct descendants of this element and the plus and tilde deal with siblings of the element but only siblings that are right after the element not before the element and you don't have selectors for the parent this is really important this is a limitation that we have in CSS probably due to performance reasons we cannot say starting from this element go to the parent of the element or go to the ancestor of this element we cannot do this so if you want to uh, refer to some ancestor of the element just place an id or a class to that ancestor and create a, a rule for that selector there okay then we've got transparency and we know what transparency is we can uh, we can add an alpha value to our colors and i think that's it for for transparency for now we also have at rules which allow you to import other elements uh, other well css style sheets in a style sheet or you can create media queries for responsiveness which is a topic that we will cover today or we can even add new fonts with font face um, we can use attribute selectors, which can be used mainly for forms. So we can have uh, a selector for every, you can have rules that apply to every input of type text or every input of type text, which are also disabled because disabled is an attribute of the input, a valid attribute. Or you can say that the attribute should start with some value, end with some value or contain some value. But these are more advanced selectors that you just need to know they exist and maybe someday you will use them. You can, use, you can create beautiful transitions and animations and as I already showed you, you don't need to know any math in order to create transitions. You can even find for resources online that allow you to uh, tweak the transition and then you can just copy the CSS code that was generated into your code base. Uh, you can have multiple backgrounds and uh, tweak whatever you want from these backgrounds, but it's not something that I'm going to show you. You can apply transformation, so you can rotate things, you can skew them, you can scale them, translate them, you can combine the transformations together. Um, I usually don't do this uh, unless I'm really, really forced to. For example, one time I had, uh, I created an invoice in HTML and in the invoice I wanted to put a stamp which was paid. So I would said, let's see if I can find a paid stamp 
maybe with a transparent background. Uh, let's say I took this one here. And then with a CSS transformation, I just rotated it a little bit so it looked a bit more like this one. Of course, if you find an image which is already rotated, that's fine. But if you don't find an image which is rotated and you want to rotate it, then it's actually pretty easy. You just, pre you just take an element and you say, hey, apply this transformation here. Rotate by, I don't know, uh, 30 degrees. And here we are, it's rotated 30 degrees. Maybe I wanted it rotated uh, counterclockwise, minus 30 degrees. And that's it. Pretty, pretty easy to do easy stuff. Pretty complex to do complex stuff. Uh, about gradients, there are so many gradients that we can do, but mainly we've got two gradients, linear gradients. So they start from one color and they transition to some other color. And you can place multiple colors in linear gradients. Or radial gradients that start from the center and spread and change the color, well, uh, gradiently uh, outwards. Um, and even with gradients, you can find some very strange and cool applications. And I think I will, I will try my best to show you one very cool hack that you can achieve with gradients. And finally, we've got media queries that allow you to adapt your website layout to multiple screen sizes or even different kinds of devices such as printers or screen readers uh, or such. But one thing that I want you to know is that it is pretty easy to build complex stuff, but if you want to build simpler stuff, you don't need all that much. There is um, a website that is called, I'm sorry, this is plenty of curse words. It's called Mother Flippin' Website. And it's a, provo it's a provocative website, of course. And as you can see, it's, as you will read, uh, we're not going to read it right now, but it says that this is a pretty damn good website that just presents the content in a readable way. It's uh, easy to read on every browser, even Internet Explorer 7. It is responsive. In fact, I can shrink it and the content is always well placed. Why is this website so good? Because it's just HTML. It doesn't use any JavaScript, it doesn't use any CSS, it doesn't use any media queries, but it's still presenting content in a readable way and even a responsive way. Of course, this is a satire. So websites should not look like this, of course. But uh, this is a prov uh, you can say a provocation. I don't know. Uh, this is provoking you to just try to keep it simple. Uh, you don't need to create fancy stuff in order to create beautiful stuff. Uh, keeping it simple is an important principle that we use in software engineering. It's called the KISS principle. The KISS principle is an acronym for Keep It Simple Stupid, and it's a design principle that states that most systems work best if they are kept simple rather than made complicated. Therefore, simplicity should be a key goal in design and unnecessary complexity should be avoided. And this is something that I will always, always uh, pinpoint and stress throughout the whole course, especially when dealing with JavaScript. You don't want to create complex stuff. You want to solve complex problems by providing simple solutions. So this is a responsive website with no media queries, but now we're going to see also some media queries. So uh, let me go back to, yeah, media queries. So um, let's create something that could be responsive. I don't know if it's a good moment right now um, because there's so many other things that I have to show you before. Let's create a media query that doesn't provide responsiveness. It just shows something or, or not. So I'm creating a new file and I say media query dot HTML, media queries. And I'm using the same trick as before, HTML5, bam, I've got everything already in place. Media queries. Okay, so one thing that I can show you pretty easily uh, in order to see media queries in action is to create some divs that will be shown only for certain screen sizes and will not be shown in certain other screen sizes. 
So I'm creating a div with an ID of mobile, and I'm writing inside of it mobile. Then I'm creating another div with an ID of, uh, I don't know, tablet, and I'm saying tablet inside of it, and then I'm creating another div with an ID of uh, computer, and this is computer. And then I'm going to create another div with an ID of uh, TV or smart TV with the dash. Yeah, I like it better. Smart TV. Because, you know, HTML, the languages of the web, can be used practically everywhere. Smart TVs could use uh, a, a web pages. Well, they could, they can, because if you have a smart TV, you can probably open a browser on your smart TV. It's not really usable, especially if you're trying to uh, type uh, characters with your, uh, with your remote control. But still, yeah, there is a browser on your smart TV, and if your smart TV is big enough, you have to address huge, huge browsers and huge resolutions. So, if I look at this media queries document, I will see nothing really fancy. media queries okay so no media queries in action right now and I can see all of my divs that's cool but now I'm going to write some style here and try to trigger the display of some divs instead of others uh, now the question arises how do I tell what is a mobile device and what is a tablet and what is a computer, what is a smart TV. I cannot just uh, query the browser and say, hey, where are you running on? What device is your, the, the device you're running on? In fact, we don't care what device this is. We just care about the width of the screen. If the screen is not really wide, it probably means it's a mobile device. It's, if it's a little wider, it probably it's a tablet. And if it's even wider, it's a computer. And if it's more even wider, it will be a smart TV. So the thing that we want to know is, are there any breakpoints uh, that allow us to tell if that device is probably a mobile device or a tablet or a PC? Well, media query uh, break points. Here they are. So apparently, these are typical device breakpoints according to W3 schools. They say that extra small devices usually are phones and they have a screen width of 600 pixels or even lower. Small devices like portrait tablets and large phones are usually starting from 1600 pixels up. Then we've got medium-sized devices, such as landscape tablets, so a tablet, but you place it, you rotate it 90 degrees and it's in landscape mode, and they usually start from 768 pixels up. And then we can have large devices, such as laptops or desktops, and they usually are 1992 pixels and up, or extra-large devices, such as large laptops, large desktops, or even smart TVs. These are not exactly the same uh, types of screens that I... Um, that I just stated, but we can stick with what they say. So I'm going to copy all this code and I'm going to put it in here in the style tag. What you see here is this is a comment, so this is not interpreted by the browser and it can stay there. So I have a reference of what this media query is about if I forget about it. And of course, these three dots are not valid uh, CSS uh, syntax. So we have to remove these three dots, maybe go to a new line and start typing some code. So um, this is what I'm going to do in, for every rule. I'm going to remove the three dots. So now every rule will be available to be written. Okay. Um, I'm also going to adjust the indentation, which is selecting all the text that I want to indent and then pressing tab multiple times until I'm happy with the results. Or shift tab if I want to indent less. Indent more with tab, shift tab to indent less. Okay, so we've got extra small devices, we've got 
small devices, medium, large, and extra large. You know what? Um, I think that I want to adapt to the breakpoints that I just found. So instead of having a div of ID mobile, I'm going to call XS, XS to say extra small. Then there's a small devices, so I'm going to call it SM for small. Then I have medium device, so I will call it MD and I will type medium. And then I'll have large device, so I will say LG instead of uh, Smart TV. Well, LG is a brand of Smart TVs, but I'm not, I'm not actually doing any promotion. And then we also have another kind of div here for extra large devices. So I'm going to use XL, extra large. Okay, so now my elements are reflecting the media queries that I created, and they all look like this. So now with these media queries, I can type inside the rules, uh, just like we already know. For example, if I want to um, uh, remove all the small, medium, large, and Excel and keep the extra small, I can say that, uh, are these IDs? Yeah. So I can say that small, but also medium, but also, look at look how I'm using the comma to separate the different selectors so I can apply the same set of rules to all of these selectors together without needing to specify the same rule uh, one for each other. If you didn't understand this, don't worry, I'm going to show you what I mean. So, all of this should have a display, for example, of none. If I write this thing here, then let's see what happens. Ooh, okay, here we are. I just see extra small. Why is that? Because my screen size is currently 600 and... Uh, max width 600? Maybe I should go with this. Wait a second. 649. Boom, okay, 600. This is working. I don't know why it's not really working here, but probably because it's uh, I'm zooming on the page. 600 is already there. Yeah, it's because I'm zooming. Okay, um, I cannot do this unless I'm zooming 100%. So I have to keep the zoom um, at 100%. Otherwise, I won't see the, the differences. But as you can see, if I now resize the developer tools uh, for widths that are uh, above 600 pixels, I still see all the... Uh, all the items, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. And if I now shrink the browser uh, window to s less six of, than 600 or just 600, I will just see extra small because every other div, according to this rule, has a display of none. So it was completely hidden. So why did I do all this? Because I could have done... Uh, I could have created multiple rules. So small will have a display of none, MD will have a display of none, etc., etc. But it's boring to write all the same set of rules for all the different IDs. So this rule that I have here is a cumulative rule that applies the same display none to all of this together. Watch out because you have to put a comma because if you don't place a comma, this is still valid syntax but it has a completely different meaning. The meaning is that inside of an SM element, there should be an MD, a descendant of SM. And instead of MD, there should be an LG. As you can see, the ho hovering on this rule will tell me what it means in HTML. And apparently in HTML, it means that an element with an ID of SM could have children, and inside of these children, uh, some, uh, at some point of the hierarchy, we have an element with an ID of MD, etc., etc. But this is not our case. We want them to be separated like this. And this means just the element of SM or the element of MD or the element LG or the element of XL. And now we can just create the same thing for every other size. But uh, we just need to tweak the proper selector. So if I'm on a small device, I want to hide everything else. So I'm going to write to hide the extra small one and the medium, the large and the extra large, but not the small one. 
And if I'm on a medium device, I'm going to hide the extra small, the small, but not the medium. So I'm just adapting the rules to what I want to see. I'm adapting to XS, SM, MD, but not large. Large should be displayed, so I'm going to remove the rule. And finally here, I'm going to use XS, and I'm going to remove the XL, which will hide the extra large. I don't want it to be hidden, I want it to be shown. So now we've got nothing visible. <laughs> okay, extra small. I could have uh, done something wrong. Let me see. Small, medium, large, Excel. Extra small, medium, large, Excel. Extra small, medium, large, Excel. No, this should be fine. Probably. Let's see what happens. So this is a very small screen. In fact, I see extra small. But then I, I make it bigger until 600 pixels. And after 600 pixels, I see that extra small disappears and I see small. The problem, as you can see, is that at exactly 600 pixels, there's nothing. Why is that? Well, because if you see how the media query is written, it says that screens up to 600 pixels will have these things with a display of none. And screens from 600 pixels on will have a display of none to the other elements. But what about exactly 600 pixels? When I have exactly 600 pixels, it means that these will not be displayed and this will not be displayed. And, well, the combination of all of them means that no element will be displayed. So we have to tweak it a little bit. We can say that starting from 601 pixels, then I will hide also the extra small. Otherwise, there's this peculiar breakpoint, which is 600 pixels, in which I won't see anything at all. Now, the breakpoint works a little better. In fact, up to 600, I still see extra small, but when I go to 601 pixels, then I will see the small taking its place. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot exactly get to 601, but you get the point. So now we don't have any blank situation. And what, I, what if I go even larger? So if I go larger, up to 768, I still see small, but then at 768, boom. Again, I don't see anything at all, but then I don't see anything at all. <laughs> so it's just not working. Okay, so what's happening now? I should see medium devices. Why am I not seeing medium devices? Um, of course, because here I'm saying that for a min width of 601 pixels, I want to not show these things. But that's not true. I don't want to show these things if I'm between 601 pixels to the next breakpoint, which is 768. So I have to say, and I think it's, um, I think it's here, and max width is 668 pixels. Let me see if this works. Yep, it, it works. So I can tr tweak these media queries to say that up to 600 pixels, I just want to see the extra small. Then, hey, Club Spinach, hi, nice to see you. Uh, up to 600 pixels, I'm just showing the extra small. Between 601 pixels and 768, I'm still in the small realm and I'm going to just display the small, so hiding everything else. And then I can say the same thing on and on with the other devices, uh, with the other device screens. So I should have uh, the same problem here. Between six, ex at exactly 768, I probably won't see anything at all. Let's see. Here it is, I don't see anything at all. And this is a problem. So I will start this media query with a, with a minimum width of six, 769. And I want to stop considering the screen a tablet in landscape mode until I reach 992 pixels. So I can say max width of 992 pixels. 
So if I now make it bigger and bigger and bigger until I reach 992, it's still considered a medium device, but then it's considered large. Uh, Club Spinach says, what, do you, what are you teaching today? Do you recommend mobile first implementation or desktop first? Oh, okay. Um, today, I'm still going with CSS. We're looking at advanced concepts such as responsiveness, and then we will see something that goes a little beyond uh, CSS, which is Flexbox, CSS Grid, the framework Bootstrap, other frameworks based on Bootstrap, and um, and I think that's it. I don't know if there's anything... Oh, and also a little bit of SAS, which is not even CSS. It's a language that compiles, a, that be, is being processed into CSS. And uh, as for the next lesson, we will definitely start with JavaScript, hopefully. And uh, as for the other question, do we recommend mobile first implementation or desktop first? Well, of course, any question of this, uh, of this matter uh, is answered with, it depends. If you're planning to create something that will never be seen from, by a mobile device, then go with desktop first. But if you plan to make your website as responsive as possible, then I would say go with a mobile first implementation, with a mobile first approach, which means uh, for everybody else, you design your website um, s starting from the mobile version, and then you decide how the mobile ver website expands for larger screens. Um, so looking at this slide, for example, you can see that this website has a header, which is comprised of two pieces, one here, one here, and then it's got a body, and then it's got three, um, you can say three cards, okay? One next to the three columns, and then it's, uh, it has some other content. So you can see that Practically all of the layouts are equal, except for the mobile one, because the mobile layout has the three columns not being columns anymore. They are rows. They are one below the other. So uh, developing the website mobile first means that I first design how it would show on mobile, and then I decide what happens when I uh, make the, the screen wider. And this is usually a better approach because sometimes when I start with the PC version, I come up with the beautiful solutions that are not easy to downsize to mobile. So if you go mobile first, you probably won't have many surprises when you scale up to uh, bigger devices. Okay, so we were looking at these um, media queries. Oh, another question from Club Spinach. Should we always use RAM for padding margin font size when we want a responsive website? I would say not only RAM, there's also M, E M, which is something that I haven't explained. And I'm sorry also, Bobby, because you are asking me continuously, what is M and RAM? Why is it important for responsiveness? I will show you right away, don't worry. But yes, don't try to not use pixels as much as you can. Uh, this, is my, uh, this is my advice to you. Uh, don't use absolute units, use relative units, as I will do in a while. So here we've got a um, media query that starts from 992, but we already learned that it's better to start from the next pixel, which is three, not one. <laughs> and we can stop this media query with a max width of the next breakpoint, which is apparently 1200 pixels. And then we can start with 1201. So now we've got all the possible breakpoints that should work pretty well. Extra small, up till 600, then it starts to be small, then up to 900 and something, no, 768, and then it becomes medium. Then we go to 900 and something and it becomes large. And finally, it becomes extra large. So as you can see, you can display things or not display things according to where you are. This is the basics of responsiveness. You can build a website just like the mother flipping website, which is already responsive by default because the text already adapts to your content, uh, to, your, to your screen resolution. But if you want to do... Uh, complex stuff, such as placing these three columns as rows for small screens, then you can use media queries to say that 
the three columns should behave as three columns up to a certain breakpoint. When the device is too small to show the three columns um, in, a, in, a, in a good way, then you, um, you just skip the columns and you put the, the, the three divs in a row. How do you do that? I will show you because I didn't even show you how to place things in column. So I will show you how to place things in column and then I will show you how to not place those things in column. Okay, so this is all about media queries according to responsiveness. Since we talked about responsiveness, let's say that so far we used only absolute units, which means, well, pixels. If I now create something, um, I don't know if I should create a different HTML file. Um, no, probably not. I'm just going to show you... You know what? I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you a practical example. Eliap. This is a website that I already showed you multiple times. I'm sorry. I'm not going to advertise this, uh, this company. But... Um, it's a website that I created recently, so I have the, the code pretty fresh in my mind. So this website, as you can see uh, by just wandering around, will probably have some, um, some paddings, some margins, some borders, and they are all specified not in pixels, but in other units. For example, this section, which is the hero container, as you can see from here, I don't know if it's big enough, I'll make it a little bigger. The hero container, as you can see, as a hero, as a, an, a selector of class hero, has a padding top of 8 REM, not pixels. But if I look at what does 8 REM mean, it apparently means that the padding is 128 pixels. So if now I replace 8REM with 128 pixels, the result is exactly the same. Nothing moved. So REM could be seen as another way to say 128 pixels. So what does REM mean? Well, we've got multiple unit measure units in CSS. CSS unit measure units. Um, I'm always getting this wrong. So let's see some units. We know about units in pixels. What is a pixel? Uh, what is a pixel? A pixel is just a dot on your screen. If your screen has a high resolution, then you probably can use lot, lots more pixels. Uh, if you have a 4K monitor, it probably means that the width of your screen can hold up to 4,000, so 4K pixels, or even more. If you don't have 4K, it probably means that the pixels are, are fewer. For example, my monitor is probably a 4K, even though my monitor is probably 3,900 something, so they rounded it to 4,000 pixels, but it's actually not really 4,000 pixels. So, given this, you can decide that um, fonts or even line height of a paragraph or even uh, the width of a div or a height of a div can have a size in pixels. So H1 here has a font size of 60 pixels. If it's too much for me, I can say 30 pixels and this will make it much smaller. And um, let's see, the paragraph, I don't remember if the paragraph has a display of block, but if I say that it has a width of 100 pixels, it shrinks and the text goes on a new line. So pixels are exactly the dots that I have on my screen. This is an absolute measure unit because it's just the number of pixels. It's absolutely um, defined by the number of pixels that I want to put. And there are so many other absolute lengths. For example, I can place centimeters I can put millimeters, I can put inches if I want to use the imperial unit system. I can use pixels, I can use points, which is used mainly for um, fonts. And we also have PICAS, which I never saw before and I never saw it anywhere used. But then we've got also relative lengths and relative lengths allow you to specify sizes 
not absolutely according to the density of your screen in pixels, but relative to some other property. For example, we've got a percentage. Let's see what a percentage is about. So, for example, if I say that this element here has a width of 50%, this is saying that the image is 50% percent the width of its parent in fact as you can see the parent is this div called uh, right the div of class right and you can see that the image takes exactly half of the width of this div or you can say that this is a hundred percent and it's doing nothing because the div has a hundred percent and the image is already a hundred percent of its uh, size what if i do two hundred percent then the image is much bigger than the the parent okay so it's just a relative measure um let's just refresh to to reset it and um, we also have new measure units such as vw and vh which are the viewport width and the viewport height so you can say for example that this image is 50% of the viewport width and it became much bigger why is that because now the width is 50% not of the parent but of the width of the whole viewport of the whole um, of the whole browser window browser tab in fact now the browser tab is uh, let's put simple numbers my browser tab is now 1000 pixels if I can no 999 I want to make it exactly 1000 I cannot 1001 and the image is probably exactly this the half of the viewport width or I can say 100 viewport width which means that this image is exactly big as the viewport which is actually not right now I see or maybe this is the problem because I had a max width of 90 uh, 90 viewport width so now the image is pretty big and it should be big as the HTML it's probably yeah it is it is I've got a um, HTML which is H which is almost 900 uh, pixels wide and the image is pretty much the same amount so every uh, every mm, with that is specified with VW means that it's a percentage compared to the whole width of the screen and uh, we've got other measure units um, some of them I really don't care about for example EX and CH we don't care about them but one important unit measure unit is EM and REM EM is uh, a measure unit relative to the font size of the container so let me see this has this first paragraph here i don't know if you see it well this paragraph here says that it has a font size of 16 pixels and a line height of 2 ems so this means that the font is 16 pixels high always but the line height and the line height is an, a property that we never saw but it shows pretty well when you go to a new line it's the spacing between two different lines the line height is 2 ems which means that the line height is double the font size 2 ems in this case just means 32 pixels because it's double this amount here and if I say 1 em you will see that the line height is much smaller if I say 3 em this is three times the height of one font and that's it so this is a unit that is relative to the font size of the current element or at least its parent and then we've got rem which is relative to the font size of the root element so the r stands for root em it's just an element um, measure probably rem it's relative to the font size of the root element 
So why should I put everything relative instead of uh, absolutely? Uh, some time ago, it was really important because we had many screen sizes available on devices, on the different devices, and especially we had multiple screen resolutions. In fact, um, there was one version of the iPhone that uh, introduced the Retina screen. Retina screen meant that the screen was, had a resolution that was so high that a higher resolution than that was, was not perceivable by the human retina, okay? So it's, it was the best resolution ever. And, and then we found out it probably wasn't because they found out a new marketing buzzword, which was 4K. But still, we had so many different devices with so many different screen sizes and different resolutions. So this means that uh, with the same screen size, we could have double the amount of pixels available for the, same, for the same size. And in this case, you could not really rely on pixels because, well, pixels can be seen differently in different resolutions. So we started using relative units um, instead of pixels. Nowadays, I don't see it that important, actually, because we also have other... Um, other solutions to this problem. For example, this meta tag here. This meta tag here says that the content of the website should adapt to the device width. Initial scale, it means also that the website is not zoomed. But if you want, you can zoom it. If you don't want to zoom it, there's another property that you can specify here that disables the ability to zoom by, you know, pinching on your mobile device. And this means that with that tag, it's not really that important to use EMs and REMs because I'm now simulating different devices. This is a Moto G4 and the website seems pretty good. Galaxy S5, the website is still pretty good. Pixel 2, Pixel 2 XL, everything seems pretty fine, uh, even though the pixels are the, the width of these devices of these devices are quite different but one of the reasons probably that the, the, for what, why this is working pretty well is that I'm using actually relative units which unit should we use for line heights at club spinach um, I would probably say em because um, it's relative to the font size of uh, your current element and uh, you probably want to adapt to the font size of the current element, not the root. Uh, there is um, a, a broader question if you want. Should I always use REM or should I always use EM? And the question is left unanswered because nothing is better than the other thing. Uh, should I use EM or REM? Let's see if I can find a good blog post that tells you what to do. Yes, this is already a good one. Um, so if you have a look at all these uh, blog posts, but there are so many others uh, out there that say pretty much the same thing, is that when you... Okay, as I already, as I already mentioned uh, at the beginning of this lesson, there was this uh, buzzing sound Okay, small distraction, but we're still here. Um, N-word, hi N-word, I haven't seen you before here. So, so I shouldn't, sh should I use e uh, PX, Uber Eats Delivery? Uh, not Uber Eats, but yeah, it was a package from, uh, I don't know, Amazon or something else. Uh, I'm not alone at home, uh, so it could happen. Yeah, but still, it, it's a package incoming. Um, so, should I use e PX? Uh, my suggestion is not to use pixels because it could break the harmony of your website. And I will show you an example of this if I am able to. So look at this image. This image is going outside of the border of this uh, background here, right? It's going a little below. How did I achieve this? 
Well, you probably know already if you saw my previous lessons, I created a negative margin bottom on this div. The margin bottom is a negative 5 REM. 5 REM looks like minus 80 pixels. And I believe it. I'm going to replace it with minus 80 pixels. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. What happens if I zoom in and out this website? Well, it stays the same. So nothing really is happening here. The browser nowadays is so smart that it's adjust the pixel density already. So I don't see any different spacing in here. But what if I want to change instead the font size of my website? The font size is too, too, too big for me. So I'm going to say, I'm going to find the place where I place the font size. It's the, in the HTML. HTML says font size 16 pixels. Now I'm going to say that the font size should be smaller, maybe 12 pixels. Okay, so now that the font size is 12 pixels, everything shrinked, of course, but the spacing here is left untouched. It's still 80 pixels. Maybe it's too much, maybe it's not, but even though everything shrinked, this thing, this spacing here, this extra margin, this negative margin, didn't shrink at all. And it broke the harmony of my website. Uh, maybe it doesn't show too much, but in uh, more complex scenarios, I will see that some things change and some other things do not change. What happens if I increase the font size much more? I don't know if, it's, uh, it, if it will show, but if I increase the font size, everything is now way bigger, but now here the spacing is not that much. I don't like this... Uh, very short spacing. I want it to, uh, I want this image to go beyond the background to proportionally the same amount of my text. So that's why if I now place margin bottom not minus 80 pixel but minus 5 REM, now the spacing is uh, proportional to the rest of the website. Okay? So it's not a matter of responsiveness anymore. It's more of a matter of um, user experience, especially when you allow the user to increase or decrease the font size. And m some websites allow the user to increase the font size for accessibility. Maybe there are some uh, um, elderly people or visually impaired people that are not able to read properly small texts. So we have buttons that can allow to increase the font size. And we don't want the layout of the website to break because we used absolute units. So we want to use relative units. Cleb Spinach says, I actually went through some blog posts where they recommended to use EM or unitless for line height property. What are your views on unitless values? Okay, um, I have to admit that I have no idea what is unitless values in CSS. So let me just see <laughs> what this is about. Oh, line, he line height of 1.5. Okay, okay. Um, I saw this before but I don't actually remember what this is. Let me see if we can find it here. No. Let's find on W3School, unit less. Line height property. Oh, okay, this is the try it. I'm, I think, I'm not sure that the unit less measure here is only for line height. I never saw unit less measures outside of line height or zoom because you want to zoom 200% so you say a zoom of two. Um, let me check the line height property and let's go to the available values for the line height. The line height can have a value which is normal so a normal line height and this is the default can be a unit less number, as you were saying, and this is a number that will be multiplied with the current font size or set the line height. So this is exactly the same as using EMs because it's just a multiply, uh, multiplication factor 
uh, based on the current font size. Then we can have a length in any unit, in Azure Manager units, so pixels, points, centimeters, but also EMs or REMs. We've got a percentage, and we also have the usual values, initial, inherit, that allows you to just uh, reset the property value or inherit from whatever you from whatever rule you had before. So yeah, this normal line height. Uh, this uh, numeric line height is something that can be used just for um, uh, for line heights, and I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same as saying 1.6 EM. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it is. So we can have a try. But first, Club Spinach says, so do you think it will be better to use unit less for line heights? Um, no, I don't think so. No, no, not anymore. I think that unitless uh, was created before the creation of EMs and REMs, which are a very nice addition, uh, a recent addition. It's an addition of CSS3. Probably line height already had this unitless measure before we could enjoy EMs and uh, REMs. So I would say that this unitless measure is now not that standard. If I create everything uh, with EMs and REMs, I would probably use EMs and REMs for line height too, especially since the line height is exactly the same. We can try. Uh, I can use this, let's see. Okay, there's this paragraph here. I don't know what, what is the line height of this, but if I say line height is 1.6, the line height changed and it's wider now, it's, it's bigger. What if I say 1.6 EM? Oops. Is it any different? Let's see. I'm going to say also 1.6 and then switch on and off. You see, the line height is exactly the same if I use uh, abs uh, this uh, unitless measure or if I say, or if I use EM. What, I, what if I use line height 1.6 REM? It changes. And it changes because, as I already told you, REM is relative to the root font size, not to the font size of this paragraph in particular. In fact, the font size that I decided to put for this HTML document was 25 pixels now, okay? But this paragraph in particular, I wanted you to have a font size relative to those 25 pixels which was 1.2 REM. So it's a little bigger. It's 120% uh, the size of the font size that I decided to put for the, um, for the whole document. So this paragraph is a little bigger. And this means that if I put a line height of 1.6 EM, this is 160% bigger than the font size of this paragraph. But if I put line height of 1.6 REM, this is 160% bigger than the font size of the whole HTML, 25 pixels. I'm not going to do the whole math. I want to just uh, show you the qualitative uh, results of this. Club Spinach says, you are very good at teaching. I'm enjoying learning from you and learning a lot from you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, this is really, really comforting for me because as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this lesson, I didn't sleep too much tonight. So you can see my eye bags and I feel that I'm not really able to convey my message. I, I cannot come up with the right words. But if you say that uh, you're, I'm conveying the message, then I'm really re relieved by that. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, so this is probably the only things that I wanted to tell you about EMs and REMs. Uh, in general, try to use EMs and REMs. So now the question is, should I use EMs or REMs? Well, in my case, in my experience, I started on, only wanting to use REMs because this way I can define sizes uh, document-wise and then adapt every single element in my document uh, proportional to the global settings that I wanted to put on my website. 
But then I started finding practical uses for EMs instead of REMs. In fact, when you start building complex websites that are comprised of multiple components, maybe multiple reusable components, for example, some, some buttons that you want to reuse in multiple places because you have multiple forms on your website, etc. Then in that case, you can, you can think of uh, one of these components as um, an entity of its own with uh, its, it, its own rules. So you want the font size, the line height, the padding, the margin to be relative to that component and not to the whole document. This makes the component much more reusable in other documents too. In fact, if you use REMs, uh, maybe your button will look beautiful on your document, but if you place it on another document where other properties and other sizes are specified, you will see the button behaving in a completely different matter, uh, manner. Um, well, whereas if you use EMs, then every size and, uh, and, and spacing and padding and margin and uh, border is proportional to that component. So if you now copy the code of that component and place it in another document, the component should be more self-consistent. So bottom line, if you're planning to create a document uh, with not real much modular stuff, I would recommend to use REMs. If you're planning to create reusable elements that you can place in multiple documents, uh, then in that case, you could try to use EMs inside of these components. When I, think, when I talk about components, I think about a very complex concept that we will see uh, probably towards the end of the JavaScript lessons, because nowadays um, websites are created with this kind of a structure in mind, a component based system and uh, components are usually written in JavaScript and are usually written with a JavaScript framework such as React, Angular, Vue.js or even Svelte. There is some, um, uh, some component system uh, that doesn't need any framework in the browser um, but for some reasons it is a standard but it's not used. Um, it's not widely used. Probably they are still trying to, um, I don't know, to, 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 to fine tune it. It's called a web component. The standard is called web components. And you can create uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript components that you can then combine into your document. But this is not a reality right now. In order to create component uh, structures, you usually use some JavaScript framework. Okay, finally, we talked about EMs, REMs, and media queries and responsiveness. And I think I can stop for now with this topic. Let's go beyond CSS, if you will. What I'm saying with beyond CSS is that CSS by itself doesn't allow you to do much. You saw some rules and it looks like they are easy to use, but you cannot create very complex stuff with just CSS. Well, that's not true. And in fact, there are some additions uh, to CSS, uh, starting from version three, which is the current version, CSS3, uh, uh, adds some uh, sort of uh, frameworks that are part of the language. And one of these two frameworks is Flexbox and it's the most important thing that you can take from this lesson. Flexbox is a, a very cool addition to CSS because it allows you finally in a very easy way to place items one next to the other and create complex layouts instead of just having elements one below the other. It's not really easy to use but I have some uh, recipes that I can show you. And there's also this very, very cool reference material that I really, really encourage you to read, to study, and maybe do some practice on it. They even created a poster about this. So uh, they are talking about the background. They are talking about some basics and terminology. Uh, 
I don't think that this is really that important right now. So, flex is just a property that you can apply to an element which is promoted to be the container element. Um, we can start right away defining this on our code. So I'm going to say uh, this is not intermediate. This is a, this is not even advanced. This is beyond. So I'm going to say zero four, zero five beyond CSS. Um, should not be a file. Sorry, guys. I told you I'm tired. <laughs> so I'm going to create a folder zero five beyond. CSS. Uh, I should have put media queries and pseudo classes probably in the advanced CSS, but let's keep it like that. So I'm going to use flexbox, which is the topic that we are discussing right now. I'm going to create the usual HTML5 Emmet abbreviation, flexbox. And I'm going to hide things so we can just see only this document, okay? This is my usual preparation phase. I create a folder, eventually, I create a file, I place the, con the, the default content of this file here, and then we start. So, Flexbox allows me to place things in a grid-like fashion, or in a column-like fashion, in an easy way, without the need of using the HTML table or the display table property that we have for divs. Um, and the flexbox uh, structure that we have could easily become responsive. So it adds also this extra feature, which is responsiveness. So the only thing that we need to do is to create a div that will be our container. And I'm using classes. We can use IDs, but I'm used to use classes, except where re it's really important to have one unique item. I'm going to call this container. And as always, I'm going to create a style tag here, which is not recommended, but still, for teaching purposes, it's so much easier for me to just have everything in one place. So I can uh, create a rule for this class, which is not dot .class, but it's dot .container, I'm sorry. And here we are. So now we can start typing rules inside of this container. The container can have multiple children. So tables usually are a tag, and I'm going to rehearse this right now, but then I'm going to remove it. The table tag is a tag that contains table rows, and the table rows have table data, or even table headers sometimes. The table can also have a table head, and uh, a table body or a table footer. So all this to remind you that the table structure is really, really complex. And we don't want this complex structure on HTML. We want a simple structure on HTML and make it complex with some CSS. The only thing that we care about in HTML is the structure of your, of your document in terms of the structure of our of the information that we want to present. So we want a container and the container can have multiple um, elements, maybe sections, maybe articles or just divs in this case. So we can have a child of this container uh, and I say child one and I can have another child so here I'm using the class child because I want all these items to be children, to be considered children of this container. Okay, so we've got one element, which is the container, and the three children here. Of course, if I now look at how this thing looks, it's not exactly what I want, probably, because I want these children to be one next, uh, beside the other. Um, let's go to 0, 05 be beyond CSS and then I can go to Flexbox. Okay, this is not the way I want my columns to be displayed. I would like to have something like this. You see this image here? We've got three blocks that are one next to the other, okay? Um, so I'm going to create a class for ch children too. A child will ha probably have some properties or probably not. Let's see. Uh, if I want to see them correctly, I could probably also give some colors so I can see them better. So I will, 
I will create also IDs. This is a class child, but it's the child one element. And this is the child two, and this is child three. And now I can give different colors to these ones. So child one will have a background color of, let's pick some cool color. I'm always starting with dark. I don't know why. Um, light blue. Is there a light red? Uh, let's let's do pink. And child two will have uh, my slow choice of color is also uh, mean to let you catch up with what I'm saying. Otherwise, I'm going too fast. Um, I want some green, some light green, maybe light green. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna like light coral. And then I'm going to create another rule for child three. So every child will have a different color. And this will be some light blue, if I can find it. Light blue, light sky blue. That's nice. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, these are nice colors. Uh, they look like a CRT TV, but still, they are colors and I can stick with that. Now, I want these three elements to be one next to the other and maybe just span the same width. Maybe they could take one third of the width of their parent. How do I do this? Well, with tables, I have to create a table tag and I have to create a table row and inside of this table row, I have to create table data elements. So it's a complex structure. I want the structure on my HTML to be as simple as this. I just want to say that we've got a parent and we've got children and the way that we lay out these children should be taken care of by CSS. So the new addition to all of this is that in the container, I can say display flex. And bam, we've got it. <laughs> That's it. We've got three children that now are, ex are have exactly the same width and they are placed inside of the container. But as you can see, they are aligned all to the left of the container. So the strange thing that happened with display flex is that now every child of this container is not actually a div anymore because the div usually spans the whole width of the container but now the divs are not spanning the width of the container they look like they they behave as inline blocks so they're they're uh, smaller is there a way i can make them fit the whole width of the container or maybe place them in other different ways well, of course there is. <laughs> That's why I'm here. So first of all, we've got a flex direction. And by default, the flex direction, I think, is row. In fact, if I say flex direction on the parent, this is just one thing that I'm placing on the parent. If I say flex direction row, nothing happens because display flex is already showing as row. But we also have column which is not really interesting because now every child is a row by itself. So they are placed like this and uh, it's, it's just like not having display flex at all. So we don't really like flex direction column, but it can be useful sometimes. And we can have row reverse if we want to, to be right to left. So we have child one as the rightmost element and then child two right and child three uh, to the left. So you don't need to specify the order on, in the HTML. You can specify the order, the natural order of things in the HTML and then reverse everything with, C, with just CSS. But let's stick with row. There's uh, other properties that we care about. One of these is, well, let's, let's, go, let's go to justify content, which is what I was talking about. Now, every item is with flex start. As you can see, every item is taking only the amount of space that the content is requiring and everything is placed at the start of this flex. So I can say justify content flex start and nothing really happens because this is the default. But now I have multiple choices. Uh, apart from flex start, you can see that we have flex end, so everything can be aligned to the right, which is not the same thing as doing row reverse, because as you can see, the order of the children is preserved. 
Oops. So we've got child one, child two, and child three. They are only aligned to the right. That's the only thing. But we also got other ways. We can put center, center, and now the items are just placed exactly at the center, as you can see, which is a new way to center things. You remember that I showed you a trick, which was placing, uh, putting a margin of zero auto to center stuff. But now you've got also this uh, other way of doing it, which is probably even better because margin zero auto, I think that usually works only if you define the width of this element that you want to center. Here, we're not even defining the width of the elements. The width of the elements is computed by the browser automatically and they are placed exactly at the center. But then we also have other choices. We've got space between. Uh, let's try space between. Nice. Space between means that the leftmost is on the left, on the left, the rightmost is on the right, the, the child on the center is exactly at the center, and they have even spacing in between, which is slightly different from space around, because if I put space around, you see that it looks similar, but we now have some space at the left of the child one and at the right of child three. How much space? Well, if this is one amount of space before child one, we probably have two amounts of space between child one and child two because every element here, child one, child two, and child three, has even space on, on its left and on its right. Sometimes it's useful, but sometimes this space around is too much and you want to have it uh, evenly spaced. That's why we've got space evenly. Let's try space evenly. Space evenly. And here we are. Now every child has exactly the same amount of space on its left and on its right. Everything is spaced exactly evenly. If you want to see this thing in action on a real website, I'll show you. But first, there's Sal that says we can use Flexbox to make a navigation bar. I made one with a list and use display inline block on CSS. Really, you did it. I would love to see it. Um, but yes, you can. In fact, I actually encourage you to use Flexbox as much as you can. And I'm saying this also because if you ever, if you're ever going to create any mobile applications, even native mobile applications for Android, uh, or iOS, you will see that they use Flexbox, uh, a similar thing, uh, which is very similar to Flexbox. So the more you practice with Flexbox on the web, the more you'll be able to use Flexbox-like layouts anywhere else. So yes, you can create navigation links with Flexbox. In fact, I'm not sure, but I think that I probably did this on this website here. Let's see this navigation menu, how I did it. I actually don't remember. We've got the nav bar here, which is absolutely positioned on the bottom. And uh, no, it's not flex. No, oh, yeah, it is. Wait a second. It is, it is. I uploaded what I've been doing. Oh, you did, uh, because I checked um, probably I checked it uh, to, ooh, wow, <laughs> no way, oh my god, this is awesome, <laughs> oh my god, so this is, this is beautiful, you even got some, whoa, you, I, I'm speechless, I'm really, really speechless, uh, I checked your website a couple of days ago, or three days ago, and I didn't see any new stuff, and now I'm left with this, this, this is really awesome, look at that, you even put uh, transparency. I I'm sorry if I didn't give e enough credit to this. If I knew this, I... Oh, you also put an about me section. This is awesome. And how did you... Oops. How did you achieve putting things one beside the other? You created a section, display block, and these columns were floating on the left, which is a really, really clever choice. Because this is what you were supposed to do before we had Flexbox. 
Before Flexbox, we had some ways to place things in multiple columns, but it was really, really difficult to achieve. In fact, Sao even had to put a width of 49%. Why 49? Well, because if you put 50, it doesn't work. So she had to put 49 for a good reason. And um, nowadays, you can... Uh, refactor your code so you're not forced to use float left anymore but you can use flexbox to place things uh, horizontally uh, club spinach says is there still any benefit of learning css floats even if i already know stuff like flexbox and grid yes there is uh, yeah it was tricky so uh, yes there is always some benefit uh, one benefit is that it's always good to know the history of stuff because the web is uh, comprised of multiple websites. Some new websites are already using Flexbox, but some old websites are still using Float. And uh, you have to understand what has been done uh, in order to make... Well, if you have to uh, modify that website, you have to know why they used Float left and how to change the float left and improve it and uh, modernize it into the Flexbox architecture. So it's always good to know the previous versions of stuff so you're able to uh, turn them into the new stuff. And uh, there's also one application of uh, float that is still relevant. And I already showed you, it's the, um, it's the image. What am I doing? So let's go back to, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the names here. Um, let's go back to, it's what not intermediate, it was in CSS space. Uh, I can do it. What I wanted to show you is again, the uh, positioning, positioning, positioning HTML. When I place an image uh, in some text, then it's probably much better to use float right. So I would still use float right and float left when I have to place floating things with some text that should adapt to the floating part. I would not use Flexbox in this case. But that's the only, uh, that's probably one of the few uh, cases in which I would still use float. And maybe for some hacks that I haven't thought of. But still, when you can, just use Flexbox now, right now. So this navbar, I didn't write all this CSS code myself. I used a, a CSS framework. So um, I just inherited some uh, rules that were probably written by someone else. And as you can probably see, this navbar is, has a display of flex. And the navbar has level items. So th all the uh, items in, of the, of the navbar. And these items have some other uh, properties that I didn't tell you about. But uh, it's like this. This is a navbar with a display of flex. It has an align items of stretch, which I didn't tell you. Um, and it has a justify content of space between. Here it is, justify content of space between. So I wanted to have them evenly spaced, but I could have, uh, well, not evenly spaced, with a space in between. I can say space evenly, and this will result in something slightly different. Or I can say center, and this will result in, in something even more different. But it's not. And why is it not? I don't know. Probably because the, um, the website is too small. Nope, I actually don't know why it's not working. But still, as you, can, as you could see from uh, my document, it actually works. Um, Another thing that I would like to show you is uh, Flexbox apply to this other website that I was showing you before. Let me just, okay, reset the, the, the size of this, uh, of this document. So how about this grid here? How did I create this uh, two rows and two columns layout? Well, if I look at how it goes, this is a features container. So this is the parent. And then I've got just four feature children. As you can see, I didn't say that this container has two rows and the two rows contain a feature each. Why didn't I do that? Because this allows me to have a responsive layout. Now we have two columns, but if the screen width becomes too small, 
way too small, then the two columns become just one column. And this is a mix of using Flexbox with some media queries, and I'll show you how in a while. But still, as you can see, I used Flexbox. This is a features container, and the features container as a class has a display of flex and has a justify content of center. I wanted these items to be centered for some reasons instead of being spaced evenly or in between, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's go on with um, Flexbox. We can justify the content. And um, you know what? I'm going to use, I don't know, space, space around. I can say, uh, uh, justify content with space around. And now my Flexbox is already done. I, don't, I didn't even need to put any rule in the children. And that is awesome. I am putting every rule on the parent and the rule applies to every children inside of it. But then we've got other, uh, other things such as align items. Align items allows you to decide whether to place these items vertically. So flex start, which is the default, aligns all the items at the top, at the start. Flex end will place the items at the bottom, especially as you can see here from these images, if they have different heights um, each. So we can try. We can try to say that this child, uh, I'm going to put it here, child one has a height of 200 pixels, but child two has a height of 150 pixels, and child three will be height of uh, 250 pixels. I know I'm using pixels, I should use EMs, but you get the gist. Okay, so these are pretty pretty high numbers. Um, let's put 100, 50, 150. Okay, much better. Um, so these children, these children are placed all at flex start, and this is the property align items, which is by default flex start. But as you can see, we've got different flex uh, flex ways. This is flex end, which places all the children at the bottom, at the end of this container. And as you can see, they're not going at the bottom of the screen because the container is still adapting to the size of its contents. So it's not 100% of which, uh, of, width, uh, of height. But we've also got center. So we can place all the items at the center. And this is one of the best things that could happen to us developers with CSS because it's really, really, really difficult. It was really difficult to place things vertically before Flex. And I will show you um, a website that tells you how many ways there were and there are now to place things vertically and horizontally. It was a mess before Flexbox. Now we just need to say align item center and that's it. But then we've got uh, stretch and baseline. Let's try stretch. Whoops. Okay, stretch doesn't do much because we have items that are not really able to stretch since I placed a height. But if I don't put a height to these elements, you will see that they will stretch to the size of the container. If the container has a fixed height, you will see all the items stretch to span the whole height of the container. If the... Um, Instead, if they are centered, you will see that they are centered inside of the container. And if I use, uh, which, what, what was the last one? Baseline. Well, baseline is not really that, in, that nice. Uh, baseline is referring to the text that is inside of these items. So you can see that it, it allows you to have different divs, plays, placed in uh, diff at different levels, but the text will always be aligned. And I, did, I probably never used baseline anywhere before. And then we've got so, other th so many other things, but uh, another thing that I would like to show you is a piece of responsiveness, which is flex wrap. So let me try to do some flex wrap. I hate this fly. I don't want to kill the fly and I'm not able to, but the fly is really annoying. So flex wrap, uh, I can put it here. Uh, I, I should probably place it here. Flex wrap can have multiple uh, values. 
no wrap, which is probably the default, but then we also got wrap, wrap reverse, inherit, initial, and set. I'm gonna use wrap. And if I say flex wrap wrap, nothing happens. But if these children begin to, to be a little wider, for example, the first child has a width of uh, 300 pixels, you can see that the column layout is broken because the, ch the first child is too big and the other two children decided to wrap, to go on a new line by themselves. Whereas if the width was 200 pixels, there's enough room to show the rest of the children. But if I erase the width, at a certain point, Flex will decide by itself that there's no room left, so I have to go to a new line. This is the basis of responsiveness, because if I have a screen that is able to see the three children in column, that's fine. But if I'm on a mobile screen, then the screen is not big enough, and the three columns will be will behave responsively. Let's say like this. Club Spinach says, when do you think is a good time to use absolute positioning? Or what, can we implement anything use Flexbot that we can implement using absolute positioning? I promise it will be my last question. I love your questions, Club Spinach. Thanks for your questions. Um, I would say that you should probably always use Flexbox and not try to mimic Flexbox with absolute positioning. Flexbox is this new messiah that we have that is able to solve all of our positioning and layout problems nowadays. So before Flexbox, we had to use float left, float right, position absolute, position relative, and different hacks that could achieve this result. But now with Flexbox, you can achieve the same results which, with a much simpler code, and it's more responsive uh, out of the box. So just use Flexbox um, from now on or CSS Grid, which we'll see after the coffee break. We will see in 15 minutes. Thanks for sticking with me. Bye, 15 minutes.
15 minutes later and we're back <laughs> so uh, probably there's just one minute left so if not anybody everybody joined there's still time but um, it's 12 15 sharp my time so i just wanted to to go back to business um i'll take this time to say that i'm really I'm, I'm really actually moved by your positive feedback. And by positive feedback, I also mean the, the effort and the work that you've done so far. Uh, this is uh, amazing, an amazing result. I see that you did a lot more than what I, uh, than what I explained, which means that you tried yourself, you scouted for technologies, you scouted for alternatives, you created this... Um, this beautiful canvas here, uh, this uh, this iframe. Uh, I don't know where you got it, but oh, it's clocklink.com. So you found a, a way to place a clock in your website by importing an iframe inside of this website. And this is awesome. This is exactly what uh, you guys as developers are supposed to do. You have to learn stuff and then learn to learn, find new things to do. And, um, and apply the, the knowledge that you acquire. So it's, it's really, really beautiful. So I, I don't know how to thank you guys. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really moved by, by, by this kind of feedback. So back to business, we we're talking about responsiveness and um, responsiveness with Flexbox. This is my example of responsiveness with Flexbox. I had this uh, Flexbox container, which contains elements, and the elements are able to adapt to the different screen sizes, even uh, placing themselves in uh, one, one row each. And why is that? How did I achieve this? Well, there's nothing new uh, compared to what I already told you. In fact, um, these guys, as you can see, have a width of 50%. And this means that these guys will try as much as they can to fit just half of the width of their container. But then, as soon as uh, the screen gets shorter, probably a media query, a wild media query appears. And in this media query, I said that every child, every feature, every child of this container doesn't have a width of 50% anymore it has a width of 100%. And with the addition of flex wrap in the container, this means that there's not enough space to put two features on the same row. So they will wrap, they will go to a new line. And that is how, given this media query here, in which I say, uh, when the screen goes to 630 pixels or shorter or narrower, then the features will be aligned in uh, every, each one in its own row. And the same goes with uh, most of the things that you can find here. For example, also this form, exactly the same. This form, I probably, yeah, this form has a class of container. Is, is it somewhere here? Yeah, class of container here. So since it's a container, it has a display flex and has a flex wrap. So this means that it's children, the inputs and the button, and uh, I don't care about this div. The inputs and the button are displayed one next to the other, except for when the screen becomes this wide. When the screen becomes this wide, I will say that the container is shorter than, uh, than usual. Wait a second, let me, let me just check again. Okay, uh, yeah, the container used to be much wider probably, or probably didn't even have a max width. But now the container is shorter and the items in this container are not able to fit in the same line. So they are going to, they are going to wrap, they're going each one in its own line. So as you can see, I created multiple media queries here, min width of 992, min width of 678, min width of 576. These are not exactly the same breakpoints that we saw before the break, because these are breakpoints that I came up myself 
while shrinking and resizes this browser. I said that it looked nice to have the form uh, spread like this, but I decided that when the form was this wide, I want it to be a little shorter, etc, etc. The same goes with these pictures here. This is the members container, and this members container is a container. And as you could see, I decided to create this class called container, so I can recycle the same set of rules for multiple elements of the same kind. So a container for me is something that has a display of flex, has a flex wrap of wrap, has a justify content of center, so every element in the document which should uh, behave like this, I called it a container. So a class is just like giving a name to a specific class of elements, a specific subset of elements that should behave the same. But this is a members container, so it's not only a container, it probably has other rules that are applied just to members which is not the case. In fact, I don't see any rules applied to members. So I probably put the members class just to be even more explicit on which kind of container this is. And each member in this case has a min width of 16 REM. But when I shrink the container, nothing is happening. And when I shrink it even more, nothing is happening on the children. So I was not piloting responsiveness with the width of the member. So I'm probably piloting the responsiveness still with media queries. These three guys have a min width of 16 REMs, which is, I don't know how much in pixels, but it's a, it's a minimum width in pixels. And if the sh screen shrinks too much, well, these guys cannot shrink any more than that, because they have a minimum width uh, rule that uh, they have to attain to. So they are starting wrapping. Now we have two items on one row and the third items, item had to wrap into the following row. And if I shrink even more, then they will take uh, their, the whole space. Okay, so this is all about responsiveness. If you use Flexbox, you can deal with responsiveness pretty easy. I reread Club Spinach's question, which is actually a pretty good question, and I really encourage you, Club Spinach, and everybody else to ask me as many questions as you want. There's never uh, a bad question. Even though I already answered to some question and you didn't get it, uh, you didn't remember it, it's always good to rehearse things. So really, don't be shy with questions. Um, please, please ask. And uh, Club Spinach was saying, uh, so can I just get rid of absolute positioning because Flexbox can take care of everything that absolute positioning was doing? Um, so, no. Uh, yes, you can do everything with Flexbox apart from when you want absolute positioning. <laughs> there are some special cases in which you want something to be absolutely positioned. Um, I actually cannot think of any... Um, you know what? Yes. Fab. Not this. Um, fab Android. Sometimes, especially if you're using an Android device, and uh, so you're using an app that uses the so-called material design, so a very sleek design, uh, this is very minimal, you can find something that is called the fab, which is the floating action button. The fab is this kind of uh, round button that is usually placed on the bottom right of the screen, but not always. And as you can see, it's there, absolutely positioned. It never changes position at all. And there's no problem if this fab is overlapping with the underlying list of uh, messages. So that's one case in which I would probably still use position absolute. I don't see any good um, improvement in using uh, Flexbox here. It probably is not a good choice to use Flexbox. I want a, a position absolute whenever I need to place something exactly there and I don't care if this thing is overlapping on something else. And uh, a fab is usually a, 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 is a good example of this, of this case. So position absolute is still relevant as much as float right is still relevant. But if you want to create complex layouts that are also responsive, then in that case, I would definitely recommend uh, Flexbox. 
I, I must confess, and I probably mentioned last time, that I tried to position absolutely this image because this image should not move around uh, in this page. So I tried something like, um, I did something like position absolute to its parent, top zero, right zero, which is not correct because I want it to be a little lower, maybe like this and a little more on the left because it's too too close to the right border so something like this but as you can see there is a problem with this it's not a problem when the screen is wide but the problem arises as soon as the screen the screen gets uh, narrower because the text gets overlapped which is something that i really don't like and what happens if i have a small device. In that case, everything is, becomes terrible. Now, with a small device like this, with a small screen like this, this image is starting to be more on the left than on the right. There's less, there's less space here than here. So, probably, absolutely positioning is not the best choice here. Also, because we don't have um, a responsive design. What happens if I have a... Um, you know, a, a small device. Maybe I don't want this thing to still be positioned absolute there, but I want it to be positioned uh, up below everything else, below the, the title, below the hero. So this is the solution that I came up with after. I say that the hero, which is this first section, which usually has the slogan and the call to action button, and maybe also this image here. So the hero is itself a container, so a, a flex box. And it has two children, the left and the right. And as always, there is a responsive rule that allows me to have one thing on the left, one thing on the right, but for smaller screens, this guy here will just be placed on a new line because there's not enough room to, for, for it to be on the same line. And that's how I placed that's how it looks like I placed absolutely this item, but it's not placed absolutely. It's actually placed with a flex box with this extra hack of adding this negative margin bottom because I didn't if I didn't put this hack, it looks like I have just two columns. But if I place this margin bottom here, this looks like the image is absolutely positioned in the page, even if it's not. Okay, I I hope that I answered thoroughly to your question and now we can go back to some other cool concepts about maybe Flexbox still. Okay, so we saw, we saw that on the container I just need to put display flex to make the container be flex, flexible. So now the container will put all its children by default in different columns on the same line. If you want to change the direction, if you want to do an RTL website, a right to left website, for example, in Arabic, Arabic, uh, then you can use row reverse or column reverse. Or you just want to place the items one after the other um, from top to bottom or from bottom to top. So you can use row or row reverse. Um, you can wrap the items and this already adds some elements of, uh, of responsiveness as we could see with the flex wrap property. Um, we can use shorthand properties. For example, flex flow is just a shorthand that allows you to place the flex direction and the flex wrap together. So you can say flex flow is column wrap is exactly like saying flex direction column, flex wrap, wrap. And you can place everything in one, in one rule. You have justify content that places elements horizontally um, by adding some extra space in between or not. And you have align items for when the items are, uh, well, uh, have some space on top or below them. And I don't know if I use this but let me check maybe i used it somewhere for example what about these features 
If I, I have an align items of center, what happens if I remove align item center? You see, there is something happening. For example, this guy doesn't have um, enough margin anymore. And this is probably because the two children of this hero have different uh, dimensions, have different heights, and now the two elements are aligned at the top. But with align item center, now the two items are aligned exactly at the center with an additional margin bottom, negative margin bottom on the image. Uh, probably it doesn't show too much. Let's see. Oops, this is text align. Um, yeah, there's a, also another thing here. So if I switch on align item center, this is placed here. When I switch off align item center, this goes a little up which is probably better because it aligns the, uh, the, the texts. And this is probably due to the fact that these images here do not have the same height and width. In fact, this is an image 80 per 80 pixels. This is uh, 79.48 per 80. This is 80 by 80, or 82 by 80, and this is 63.41 uh, per 80. So these icons have slightly different bounds, and this shows when I align the items in, uh, in different ways. Um, these items are all placed well, and everything is still placed exactly the same. Maybe this, these inputs here. No, the inputs are also placed well together because they have the same height. So nothing new here. Um, what else? What else? We can align the content and I already sh told you this, but it's not really, uh, I don't think it's worth to try everything that is, uh, uh, that is pertaining Flexbox. You can try them by yourself, but still align content allow you, allows you to Align all the contents to the start, to the end, to the center, or you can stretch all the elements, or you can space between. And as you can see, space between is vertically. It's the vertical space. So it's not exactly the same as justify content. Align content is for vertical spacing. And also space around. It's pretty much the same as justify content, but for vertical spacing. And these are all the properties that you can add to the container. Then there are some properties that you can add to the children. In fact, for example, you can specify a different ordering uh, for the items. The default order for every item is zero, so they will be ordered it is in the same uh, order in which they are specified in the HTML document. But I can say, for example, that child1 has an order of two and see what happens. You see, child one is now the last element. Why is it the last element if I specified order of two? You remember that in programming in general, we always start counting from zero because it's more convenient, because it's also more performant for the computer. So we start from zero. Order zero just places the child where it should be. Order of one is saying, okay, this is not what I expected actually, uh, order of one just saying that every child that has an order of zero will be placed before and order of one will be placed right after. So this is a way to give priority. Um, child two and child three have a higher priority and will be displayed right away. Child one has a lower priority because this number is bigger, so it will be placed right after. So if I say that child three now, no, child two has an order of one, you will see that child three is displayed first because it has by default an order of zero, so it has the highest priority. And then child one and child two will be displayed after. But if I say that child one has an order of two, then I'm lowering its priority, which means that now they are completely reversed. So this is another important concept. I can place my children in the order they should be from a logical point of view in HTML, but then I can mix the order with using CSS. I don't need to place these items in a specific order from the HTML because it's not a concern that HTML should have. This is a concern of CSS. 
We also have flex grow. Flex grow is really, really important, and I'm going to show it to you. What does flex grow mean? Well, you can imagine it, of course. Uh, if I have three items, these three items are taking exactly the, 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 the same amount of space, um, uh, the same width. But maybe I want this child to be larger. So I can say flex grow of uh, one. And the item that has a flex grow different from zero will just try to take all the available space left. And as you can see, this is really cool, especially if we want to have a layout that has a main section and maybe two section um, on the sides, just like any good website with a header, with a footer, a main content which spans the whole available width and maybe one or two items on the side. If I place flex grow on more than one child, well, they probably try to share an equal amount of space. So child three is not uh, expanding. Child one and child two are trying to expand and will take half of the available space. What if I say flex grow of two on one of the children? Well, in this case, proportionally, child two is twice bigger than child one, hopefully, or almost. Okay, so you can, uh, you can tweak the, the amount of space that every child can grow. As you can see, flex grow, if you put a one on every one, they will just grow to span the whole width available. But if you place a grow two on one of them, well, this guy will be twice as large as the others. Um, let's try to put this here. I can say that every child will flex grow, but child two will override this property by growing four times. This is what happens. It's not really growing four times, but probably because there's not enough space in here. But still, this has a flex grow one, this has a flex grow one, and this is, try is overriding the flex grow one by saying I'm growing even more than that. And you can grow more or you can grow less. Uh, well, a negative flex grow doesn't mean anything. If I say flex grow of zero, it's not growing at all. Flex grow of one, of course, it will just try to share the same amount of space. But also we can shrink. And by default, everything can shrink just by one. So if you want something to even shrink instead of growing, you can with this property, um, if necessary. I don't know if we can uh, make it. Let's try to see what happens if I shrink. Well, I think that everyone should grow, but child two should probably shrink. Frex shrink. Oops, I didn't write it correctly. Flex shrink of one, of two, of three. No, it's not working. Probably because everyone is growing. Let's see what happens if I grow row zero. Mm, nope, it's not working because it's, it, uh, it's uh, clashing with flex grow. So I cannot say that these guys are able to grow. They should only be able to shrink probably. And um, I don't know how to show this to you. Let's try a let's try a max width of two hundred pixels. No, a width of two hundred pixels. This is too much. Let's um, make them a little smaller so they can fit all in the same page. Something like that. So this child two is sh is able to shrink. No, because it has a fixed width. Okay, um, I don't know how to put that. Let's do a min width, but a min width, I think it's exactly the same. Yeah. So, um, no, I, I cannot find a proper, um, a proper example for shrinking. You know what? Let's find it on the internet. Flex shrink CSS. We'll probably find a good way so here it is oh wait a second that's why because i'm still i'm still wrapping i don't want to wrap anymore because otherwise there's no reason to shrink so now the children are not able to be placed inside of this container is there anything i can do yes probably i can shrink someone 
but not with a min width. Let's try with width. Not even. It's not shrinking at all. Max width is uh, exactly the same. I should probably put some more text in here. Child2, which is going to shrink. Okay, so this guy is not shrinking at all. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, it's not it's not working at all. So let's let's have a look at uh, some cool example. So this guy says I shrink with effect shrink of 0, it's not shrinking at all, even if it's going outside of the bounds of uh, the bounds of its container. But if I say flex shrink of 1, you will see that it will shrink as much as it can in order to uh, host to, to, to allow any other children to be to be visible here and flex shrink of two shrinks even more as much as the internal text allows to so yeah it, it, it usually works not in my example I'm sorry but it usually works if you want to see a working example we can just have a look at other examples so here we've got this div with ID of main and multiple divs with an inline style. And we're saying that the main element has a display of flex and just this. So it's, uh, it's showing as um, every element in the same line and it's also using a flex, um, what was that? F flex direction of uh, row and also of no flex wrap and a justify content of flex start because this is the default. But now we've got every div which has a flex grow of one and a flex shrink of one. But this pseudo class here says that the div with the number of two, which is probably the second one, because unfortunately in CSS, um, it's exactly the opposite of what I just told you. In CSS, we usually start counting from one, not from zero. It's, it's strange, it's counterintuitive, but it, it goes like this. So nth of type one is probably referring to the first element. Nth of type two is referring to the second element because it's the nth element, so it's the second one. And as you can see, flank shrink of three is actually doing something. The second element is shorter than the other elements. So if I wanted to do exactly the same thing here, I should probably, first of all, not wrap anything, not justify content, and I should probably now be able to to shrink, maybe, 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 let's see, yeah, it, it is shrinking just like the others, <laughs> so it's not really, hap nothing is really happening, let's try a flex shrink of uh, one here, and a flex shrink of two here, is it doing anything different? It actually is. Okay, finally. Um, I don't know if it's true, but no, probably not. Yeah, I, I, it seems like this is shrinking faster than, uh, the, than the other elements, but I'm not sure about this. What do you think about this? Is it shrinking faster? I think so, because now, for example, there's a little more space in the first and third element, but this child too has not that amount of space. So it shrinked before anyone else. And I think that this is enough proof that flex shrink is working somehow. Let's keep it like that. And uh, what else do we have? We have flex shrink, we have flex spaces, we have this shorthand property called flex. And it, there's also an align self, which is, allows you to override the alignment of one child. So you can say that the container aligns every item at the start, but this child in particular wants to instead align itself to the end. So you can override this, uh, this behavior. And as you can see, uh, there are not many properties uh, pertaining to children because most of the properties are already in the container, which is probably much better. 
And that's it. This is Flexbox. I hope that you liked it. I hope that you will be able to use it. If you're not able to use it, if you have any problems, just reach, reach out to me. Uh, you can join our Slack workspace and you can uh, direct message me or even better, you can write messages in the school's channel so you can share your doubts, your problems. And there are some uh, other students or even former students that could uh, share your problems and uh, or, or help you solve these problems if I'm not available. Um, you know what? I'm going to copy the invitation link and put it in the in the chat here. So if you haven't joined yet, you are able now. Okay, after Flexbox, we've got CSS Grid. CSS Grid is a new addition which was available just for Mozilla Firefox for some time and then it was uh, expanded to every WebKit-based browser, so every new browser nowadays. Maybe Internet Explorer is not able to use CSS Grid and um, maybe Internet Explorer is not even able to use Flexbox or is it's using it in an improper way. And this answers again Club Spinach's question about, so is, is it a good thing to learn float and position absolute nowadays? Yes, also for another reason is if you need to target really, really old browsers, then you cannot use Flexbox, you cannot use CSS Grid, and you have to go back to the old ways of layouting items in elements in the, in the document. And um, yes, nowadays there are some companies that still use Windows XP, Windows Vista, and Internet Explorer 7, 8, or 9. So if you're so unlucky to have to deal with these browsers and these operating systems, you have to know a lot more than Flexbox. You have to know all the things that were before Flexbox. CSS Grid is a new addition, but it's not better than Flexbox. It's a good alternative and it can be used in some ways. I think it's a little more complex and I think it allows for less responsiveness. So in my personal experience, I usually use CSS Grid when I don't really care too much about responsiveness because CSS Grids allows you to lay out things in a grid-like fashion, like the, in this image. As you can see, we've got a header that spans four columns. Then we've got a main, which is on the left and spans two columns. Then we can leave an empty dot, an empty space. Then we can have a sidebar on one that spans one column. And then we've got a footer that spans four columns. All of this in three rows. If you see me scratching my nose, it's because I think that the fly decided to suicide herself by getting in my nose. <laughs> okay, that's protein. Uh, so, a good reference for CSS Grid is still this website called CSS Tricks. And I really encourage you to go to this website, uh, which has lots of really good tutorials and documentation about CSS and even beyond CSS. CSS Grid is not really easy to use because it has lots of properties, lots of shorthand properties. And I'm going to show you the way that I generally use CSS Grid, which is not the only way, but I think is the, uh, it's the most user-friendly, developer-friendly way to use CSS Grid. So I will try to create this kind of grid like this, and I will try to do it on a new file. So beyond CSS, I'm going to create grid.html. I create a new file and here I do HTML colon five in order to generate all the boilerplate code. CSS grid. Oh my God, the fly is still alive probably. Ah, why is it so? Okay, as always, I'm creating the style tag here and I'm going to create the layout of my website. The cool thing about CSS Grid and Flexbox is that I can just not care about how I want to lay out things. I just care about the content and the logical structure of the content and then care about the layout in a separate language, which is CSS. So for example, here I've got, well, a website 
which has a header, a main, a sidebar, and a footer. And this is the only thing that I need to care right now. I can create a div that is my, well, my grid. This time I'm going to use IDs because I don't think I will use any more grids in here. And this div has a header, so I'm gonna create a header and I'm gonna place header in here. And then it, ha it has a main, if I remember correctly, which contains main. Then I don't have that much memory, I I'm sorry. So I'm going to look at it again. A sidebar, it's called sidebar. So it has a div ID sidebar in which I will place sidebar as text in order to see something. And then finally, I'm gonna put a footer. If you paid attention in my previous lessons, you know that I can even use the header tag instead of creating a div with ID header. This is a semantic tag that gives more meaning to the thing that I'm creating. And I probably encourage you to do the same, but I'm not, <laughs> okay? I'm not in this context, but I encourage you to use header tag, footer tag, main tag. Uh, I don't remember that there's a sidebar tag, but there's an aside tag, which is exactly the same. So if you want, you can use those semantic elements instead of creating generic divs with special IDs. Okay, so right now I'm going to create empty rules for every element that I've got here. Uh, wait a second, uh, header. Um, main sidebar with a hash symbol in front of it, which identifies uh, an ID because I'm using a, an ID selector and footer. I think that those are the only things that I want. If I want to be more specific, I can say grid greater than header, which means the header that is a direct descendant of grid. And you can see from the suggestion, it says element of ID grid containing an element of ID header. So this is the header that is inside of the grid. And I'm being a little more specific if, it, if it's worth it. It's not worth it in this case. So I'm just leaving it like this. Uh, I want to add colors, so I'm going to use more so the same colors here. The header is, is uh, the header is orange, orangish. Let's see if I can find. Uh, yeah, I have to write things correctly before. Okay, I'm gonna use orange. And what about main? Main is bluish. <laughs> uh, blue, not not blue like that. Um, you know what? I like the the, the light sky blue. The, these these colors that I used a while ago. So the main is light sky blue. The sidebar was something like coral, light coral. So the sidebar with the background of light coral, and finally the footer will have a background of what was the color here? Light green. Okay, let's have a look at how the grid behaves right now. Spoiler alert, crap. This is not a grid. But this is how the elements of my document are logically um, structured. This is the structure of my document. I don't need to put any visual structure to this. The header, the main, the sidebar and the footer are all part of my grid. And that's it. That's the only thing that I need to know. Now, if I want to place them in a CSS grid, you can look at the, um, uh, this website that gives you lots of different information. The first imp important information is that you just need to do a display of grid. There's also inline grid, but I don't care about that. So let's put display of grid and see what happens. Here's what happens. Nothing at all, because unlike Flexbox, Grid needs a lot more uh, properties in order to work properly. Uh, grid doesn't know how you want to place things. But one thing we have, you see that there's a Grid label here on, on the side of the element. And if I hover on this element, I see the outline of my elements. So. The grid system is already helping me identify the different cells that are part of my grid. Right now, by default, the grid has four rows, each one having just one cell. This is by default. 
but then we can create multiple rows, multiple cells placed in different places. And there's so many ways to do this. You can use grid template columns and grid template rows. You can use uh, grid template area. Where's that? Grid template areas. You can use different things in between and it's really, really confusing. So what I want to do is to show you how I usually start organizing a grid, which I think is pretty easy, hopefully. So I'm going to use grid template areas as the property. Grid template areas is pretty strange because it um, asks for uh, one or multiple property values, which are strings, so you have to quote them. And here you can define in a pretty easy way the structure of your grid. How is our grid uh, specified? We've got the header spanning four cells and we can give a name to these four cells and we call them header header and I repeat this sentence I repeat this word four times because I'm saying that the first row is comprised of four cells in which I will place the header the header spans four cells then I can use another string next to it which describes the second row. So every string describes one row. This was the first one, now I'm going to describe the second one. The second one has a main that spans two cells, so I'm going to say main main, and then there's a hole, and in order to define a hole, I use a dot. I leave a dot there. And then we've got another element which I will call sidebar. It's not really easy to see the structure of a, a complex CSS grid if I put everything on the same line. But in CSS, I can even place things uh, indenting them in a different way. I can even put extra spaces if I want them. Uh, so this will make the CSS grid a little more visible. You can see header, 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 and below main, main, dot, sidebar. We need a third line. And the third line is just footer spanning four columns. So I say footer, 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 footer. And uh, I can align everything together, but actually it seems like it's already aligned. Do you see the structure of the CSS grid? This is exactly the same structure that I see here, but I'm using words instead of pictures. So I think that this is much easier to, to, to write and to read also. The problem is that all of this doesn't work at all. It just created four columns now, and it created four columns because I told because grid template areas is uh, telling that there are four columns, and there should also be three rows because there are three strings there. But the content that I created seems to be available only for this first row. There is something missing here. And what is missing is that there's no real correlation between this name here and the ID of the element that I gave. Because in fact, this could be the ID, or it could be the class, or it could be the header element. How does grid know which element I'm targeting? And this is why in every child, it is much better if I state that this header is mapped to a grid area of header. If I say this, I'm saying that this element in particular, and now I can also change, uh, it can be the ID or the class or the element tag, I don't care. I'm saying that this header is coupled, is re related to the area of the grid that here I called header. To make it even more clear, I can call it as, as I wish. I can call it H. The important part is that every one of these should be also called H. This is the correlation. It's not a correlation between these names and the selector. It's a correlation between these names and this other property value. Now that I know this, I can specify the grid area of every one of my cells. So, grid area of main, I used the same name 
because, well, in virtue of the principle of least astonishment, what if I say that the tag with ID sidebar is actually an aside? Well, I'm astonished, I'm surprised. Why did I use the term aside instead of sidebar? I'm trying to use consistent naming here because it's not surprising and it allows to read and write and modify and, uh, um, and maintain this code better. So I created a grid area for every single child of my grid. The result is this, I've got a grid, that's it. Now, the only thing that I care about is the width and the height of this grid. Maybe I want this grid to have the first row to be 50 pixels high, but the second row should span the whole height of the document. And maybe the footer should be other 50 pixels high. So in, if I want to specify the heights of the rows and the widths of the columns, I can use these other properties, grid template columns and grid template rows. This is how I do it. And as you can see here, the container says that grid template columns has 40 pixels, 50 pixels, auto, 50 pixels, 40 pixels. What does it mean? It means that I have in total five columns and the first column should be 40 pixels wide, the second column should be 50 pixels wide, and the same goes with the other uh, two columns on the other side. And then we've got this other special property, auto, which means that it will span the whole width of the grid, which is really similar to flex grow one that we saw in Flexbox. But in CSS grid, we don't have flex grow one, we have auto. So in our case, and the same goes of course with grid template rows, uh, you can even use percentage and you can even use another unit, measure unit called FR, which means fraction. And I will probably show you in a while. So um, this are, these are all properties that I can specify on the grid itself. So I can say that grid template rows will have three different properties, one for each row. The header is 50 pixels height, high. Then we'll have uh, the second row, which will be, I don't know, let's try 100 viewport high. I don't know if it works. And then we'll have the footer spanning 50 pixels. What, what will happen? Okay, it kind of worked. As you can see, I have to scroll. And why do I have to scroll? Well, because if the second column is 100% of the viewport height, and I'm adding also a header and a footer, and also some margin that is automatically provided by the body, then of course, this grid will be larger than the whole, than the whole uh, document. So I cannot just use 100 viewport height. I can use something like 80, if I want to make it, nope, not enough. Let's try 50. Okay, this is already cool. Or I can do some uh, extra calculations that I will show you in a while. No, I'll, I can show you right now. There's also another CSS cool thing that you can do right away. And it's not just for CSS grids. You can perform calculations on the fly. Or better, you can allow the browser to do so, those calculations for you. So I can try to do something like calc. I don't know if it works, but I can say calc. And in parentheses, you can say, I want 100 viewport height minus the 50 pixels of the header and the 50 pixels of the footer. I will say cumulatively 100 pixels. Will this work? Yes, it worked. But still, I have some margin in the body that I really don't like. So I can just mute the margin on the body with a new rule. You remember how you reset um, the, the default rules that we have on the browser. And now, as you can see, the grid is perfectly um, spanning the whole document. And if, in fact, the second row is spanning the right amount. I could probably also use auto. Let's see what happens if I use auto. No, auto is not good. Why is it not good? Well, the reason is that the grid is not as big as the document. 
is as big as its content. So auto, in this case, doesn't mean really anything. But if I say that the grid is really high, for example, 100 viewport height, then the auto will take into, will have an effect. So in this case, I changed from saying that the second row tries to be as high as possible to the grid tries to be as high as possible and the second row will adapt to it. Uh, as you can see, the result is exactly the same. So you can choose. I'm going to choose this. I will say that the grid is 100, oh, well, come on. Height is 100 viewport height and the grid template rows is auto. Why did I use this instead of the first one? Because in the first case, I had to do some calculations. I had to, uh, to use that calc 100 viewport height minus these uh, other quantities. But in this case, I just need to, that, to say that the grid is really high and the second row will just adapt to fit the whole available space. So I think that this code is a little simpler. And since it's simpler, it's better because it's more easy, it's easier to read and it's easier to write. Everything's good so far, yeah? I see you're very silent, but probably that's because you're really attentive and that's good. Sometimes I'm afraid that the stream went off or, or something technical went off, but still, you're sticking with me, I'm, I'm sure of that. Okay, so this is how I create a CSS grid. Oh, if I want to do the same with the, uh, with, with the width of the column, maybe this sidebar is too, is too big for me. How did you get rid of the margin? Oh, okay. Yeah, by default, the browser adds a margin to the body. So I quickly did a body margin zero in order to eliminate, remove completely the default margin of eight pixels that was provided by the browser. So I, I was pretty quick, but I added this style at the top in which I said body has a margin of zero. And that's how you do it. Is the light good? Yeah, because I turned off. Did I turn? No, the light is still turned on. Okay. Hope this is uh, exhaustive. So uh, I can also trigger the, um, the width of the columns and probably you already know how to do this. I can say grid template columns this time. And I need four values because my grid has four columns. Main, main, dot, sidebar, or header, 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 footer, 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 footer. And in this case, I can say, for example, that, I don't know, maybe I want the sidebar to be very small. Maybe, let's, let's say it's 50 pixels. And this is the last element. So I'm going um, backwards. Um, the empty space should be as small as possible. Um, I can even say auto and it will adapt to whatever spacing I'm putting here on the main and the main will have, uh, I don't know, let's put also 50 pixels, 50 pixels. So these are four values, 50 pixels for the first column, 50 pixels for the second column, 50 pixels for the last column and then auto for the row, for the column in between. And this is what's happening. So I've got this grid, which as you can see has squares in it because the, the header is inside of a square. The sidebar is all there. The main is spanning two square-like uh, columns. And then we've got this huge space in between that is too big. <laughs> I don't care about this space in between, but still, as you can see, this is how you can easily lay out a CSS grid. There are so many other things that you can try but I'm not going to in detail with that. Um, I'm just going to say that the grid has one huge downside and it's its responsiveness. In fact, the grid will always behave as a grid. It will not have any elements going on a new line. It's not wrapping. So whenever you need a responsive layout, I would still recommend Flexbox. Um, there is some responsiveness that you can achieve with CSS Grid, but I never tested it. And uh, it relies a lot on that calc function that I showed you. So this website is made with CSS Grid, apparently. And how did he achieve this result? I can edit this website on CodePen and inspect what he created. 
even though probably this website is way too complex for my taste. But still, we've got a, a main of class wrapper that contains a hero, and the hero is, of course, this section here. So that says, you thirsty, and it has an article with a link, the call to action link. And this is just one of the sections. But then, inside of the wrapper, uh, apart from the hero, we've got this other section, which is breweries. And breweries is a list, a UL, with some LIs, which contain a figure, which is an item that I, an element that I probably haven't described in detail, but it's not really important. Let's say that's, uh, it's a complex element that allows you to create an image and also a caption and uh, have them, you know, look good with some CSS. And um, this um, brewery also has this uh, paragraph here and also a link. So there's lots of things going on, but this, the structure is uh, pretty easy. Let's see the CSS. Apart from uh, other things that I don't care about, for example, the hero, et cetera, et cetera, I'm, I'm really interested into uh, these three columns. If it's true what they say, they achieve these three columns with a CSS grid instead of with Flexbox. And they could make it responsive even without media queries. How did they do this? So breweries UL, so the unordered list of the breweries, is the grid. And it used the grid template columns value of repeat auto fit min max 320 pixels 1 FR. And it created also a grid gap, which is a property that I haven't explained, but it adds the gap between cells. So you can add some gap, and this is a gap of one REM. And every item just has a border and a border radius. So the magic here is in this formula here. And I don't want to explain this formula also because I'm not sure I'm able to tell you what this formula is. I know that the repeat function just repeats a value. And this is something that we can also add if we want to. If I am lazy and I don't want to repeat 50 pixels two times, I can say repeat 50 pixels two times. I don't remember if the two should be placed before or after. It should probably be placed after. So, no, it's not working. It was repeat two times 50 pixels. Yep, this worked. Okay, so repeat is just a function that allows me to repeat a value multiple times. I had tw two times 50 pixels. Now I have 50 pixels just set one time. And this is pretty... Um, convenient, especially if I have many columns, many adjacent columns that have the same values. If I want all the four columns to be 50 pixels wide, I can say repeat four times 50 pixels and that's it. Now all of the columns are exactly 50 pixels wide. So this is one of the parts that I see here. Repeat auto fit min max. But this is not a number, this is auto fit. What does auto fit mean? Um, auto fit mean? I say auto fit, I try. And this is what happens. Uh, it seems like it's. What happens is that these columns are probably repeating as many times as needed to fit inside of this page. What happens if I now shrink it? Oh, something happened. You see, the empty space got removed. And if I make it even smaller, the main was also munched away by the sidebar. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening at all. But we've got Google. So we can say, what does auto fit mean in CSS? And there's an article from CSS Tricks that sh shows you what does this thing mean. To achieve wrapping, we can use the autofit or autofill keywords. So it's made for wrapping. And there's a difference between fill or fit that we can read, but I'm not going to do this. Uh, oh, there's also another thing that I had to show you, which was one FR. So if I repeat four times, instead of 50 pixels, I, I just uh, say one FR. I'm saying that four times, this guy should 
occupy, these four columns should occupy one fraction. So one FR just means that each element will take one fraction of the available space, an equal fraction of the available space, which means that I can use something like, instead of repeat four, I can say one FR, one FR, two FR, one FR. This means that I have four columns as always, but the first columns take one fraction, the second column one fraction, but the third column takes two fractions, so it should be twice as big as the other columns, which is true. And this is exactly the same as flex grow, because flex grow, you can say grow until you, uh, until you are equal to everybody else or grow twice as much. So it's pretty much the same thing. So as you can see here, they are using a combination of repeating the same amount because they were lazy because otherwise they could repeat this thing uh, three times. But then they are combining it with auto fit. So it's not repeat three times, it's repeat as much as needed by the available space. And then we've got this other, uh, this other function, mean max, which is, I don't know, it's probably uh, calculating which is the minimum or the maximum value between these two. But I don't know, min max CSS. Okay, so min max defines a size range greater than or equal to min and less than or equal to max. So min max is going to give you a number that is between these two values. And the amazing thing is that it's computing this intermediate value uh, between two values that are not in the same measure unit. So this, this one is 20 pixel, this is even auto. And it's going to calculate, it's going to compute the best, um, the best size range. So there's lots of things going on and I'm not really interested in understanding them. In fact, I think that using CSS Grid this way allows you to create a grid-like layout, which is probably working pretty well. As you can see, these three items are now each one in a, on a new line. But if I now resize, I will see the two items on, uh, on two different lines. And if I resize again, I see the three items on, three, uh, on one line only. Uh, but at what cost? I think that this is really, really difficult to read and to write. Uh, the only cool thing that I see here is that, uh, well, I've got a very nice HTML layout and I got rid of media queries. I didn't need a media queries to achieve responsiveness, but the cost of it was creating this rule that is really difficult to read. Even if I completely understand this rule right now, when I read it three months from now, I will probably have forgotten the meaning of it and I will have to recompute everything again. So that's why I personally don't really like uh, using CSS Grid for responsive uh, websites. Another reason why I prefer Flexbox is, well, the reason that I told you before, because if you start using React Native or if you're using, uh, if you're starting to, to create Android applications or iOS applications, there's no such thing, such thing as a CSS Grid. They are using some sort of Flexbox style uh, layout. So I think it's much better to use Flexbox because it's, um, you know, it's, it's more generic, it's more general, you can achieve more things and you can use it in more contexts, even outside of the web context. CSS Grid can still be useful for some cases. For example, if you don't need to be responsive at all, if you need a, a website just for desktop, or tablets, but not mobile phones. So you don't need any responsiveness, nothing that uh, goes up and down or new lines. Then CSS Grid is actually pretty neat and pretty easy to read and write. I like to read uh, my CSS Grid like this. It's very clear what the CSS Grid will be like um, when, I, when I show it on the browser. And, um, one example of a, of a layout that could benefit from CSS Grid is probably the Europass CV. Probably, I don't know. Um, not everyone is European here, so 
the Europass CV, I'm sorry if I'm looking at someone else's CV, but if it's online, it means that they have no problem in showing their CV online. You know what? No, I, I, I don't feel like I'm going to show my CV. Sorry, guys. Okay, this is my CV. Uh, it's a long one. And as you can see, this CV has a very basic structure. It's the European accepted structure. And the structure has two columns. One column is pretty narrow and the other column is a little wider. And uh, you can see that it's some sort of grid. Personal information has this text in here. Then we've got the image on the left and all this text on the right. Then we've got position, computer professional, work experience, and we've got this uh, divider, the separator. And then we've got this, uh, this, uh, this date, and we've got this uh, title and paragraph here. So this could be probably pretty easily achieved with a CSS grid. You can achieve the same thing with a Flexbox, of course, I would probably go with Flexbox, but still, CSS Grid is pretty decent as an alternative here because I don't care how this curriculum will be shown on a mobile screen. It should probably be shown exactly like this. It shouldn't move things around. Okay, so this is all I had to say about CSS Grid. You can study it by yourself, you can try yourself to understand what this is about, this square brackets row one start. I must confess, I never paid too much attention to this, so I have no idea what this is about. But one thing that I know is that if you want, you can even get rid of grid template columns and grid template rows, because you can place all these values, the width of the columns and the height of the rows, in the same place where you are, where you have your uh, grid template areas. So you can do something like, um, like this, which I don't really know what it means. And I don't even really care. I think it makes my layout more difficult to understand because there's so many things around or in between my, my strings. I would like to have my strings as they are here because they are much easier to read and, and thus to maintain. Okay, we've got so many other properties. Grid gap, which I already mentioned, allows to add some gap in between cells. Um, justify items, of course, if you want to justify the items on the left, on the right, centered, probably stretched. And you can align items vertically. So at the top, at the bottom, at the center, or even stretch. You can do many things, but I don't think it's really important to have a look at all the different possible things that you can do with CSS Grid. I think that Flexbox is much more important than CSS Grid. So that's it for CSS Grid. And what do we have else? Well, uh, I created a slide about centering things and the reference is, again, another article from CSS Tricks. Because I like this article, it has uh, some branching. What happens if you need to center things horizontally? You just expand this and it asks you other question. Is it inline or inline something elements? For example, inline block or inline grid or inline table, like text or links? Then in that case, you can use text align center. But if there is a block level element, maybe you can use margin zero auto. You remember this recipe? But if there is more than one block level element, then you probably want to use some other recipe that is telling you here. And it's strange that it's not telling anything about uh, flex, but if you want to display things horizontally, you can use, of course, uh, Flexbox. What about vertically? If you want to play, center things vertically, well, if it's a single line, you can use padding top and padding bottom. If it's multiple lines, then you can use the vertical align property probably or flexbox etc etc so there are multiple things that you can uh, that you can try if you need to center vertically and horizontally well as you can see 
Can you use Flexbox? Because if you can, just use Flexbox. If you want to center th something at the center of your, of your page, you just say that the parent has a display of Flex, justify content center, align item center, and your child will be perfectly placed in between, uh, in the middle. If you want to use CSS grid, you can. You can create a, a grid with just one item in the center. Uh, but it's stupid. I don't think that you need to create a grid with just one cell inside of it. Uh, there are other ways, and these are the ways that we used to have when we didn't have Flexbox. For example, you can have a parent with a position relative, and the child is absolutely positioned inside of the parent. But there's a problem with that. And I want to show you this problem. That's too much in here. Oh, come on. Uh, so we've got the main with the div. There's a body which we don't care about. The main is probably the parent, which has a position relative. And the div inside of it has this thing here. It has a position absolute. And the top is 50% and the left is 50%. So you, place the, you, you take this div, you position it absolutely but not at the top left. You want it midway, at 50% of the width and the height. The problem is that this element will be positioned from the top left corner. So as you can see, this element is not centered at all. So the trick is to apply this uh, CSS transformation that translates the whole element back 50% of its own width and height. And this is the way you can place the, the element completely centered. So you translate the whole element at the center, but element-wise, you place the element back 50% of its own width and height. How ugly is that? It's a hack, and it's a hack that we had to use and perform because we didn't have Flexbox. Now that we have Flexbox, you can just say that the parent has a display flex, justify content center, align item center, and the child will be exactly positioned at the center. And that's it, okay? So there is this guy at this conference that said, there are only two hard things in computer science, naming things and vertically centering things. This is actually uh, a new, well, it's a cover of an old, a saying that says that there are only two hard things in computer science, naming things and invalidating cache. So the second uh, hard, things, hard thing was moved by this guy to vertically centering things. It was really difficult to vertically centering things in uh, CSS, but now it's not because we can use display flex. And uh, about naming things, this is still a hard, t uh, hard thing to do. In fact, uh, lots a lot of our a lot of our time that we spend as developers um, is wasted in finding the right name for a variable an element a selector an id a class but it's worth our time so one thing that i will probably try as much as i can to teach you is take your time to do things that look trivial look like uh, uh, unimportant details but they are actually really really important naming things the correct way is a really important matter and we'll try to do this as much as we can we've got half an hour left everything right everything cool hope so uh, my my cell phone is saying that I have fewer viewers than before so maybe someone went to sleep and that's fine, because maybe you're in a different time zone or you have something else to do. Uh, I saw that still the amount of viewers of my lessons are pretty, uh, pretty high. Uh, last lesson had uh, something like 122 viewers, which is much more than the live viewers I have right now. So I'm really glad if it's not just a case, it's just not people randomly stumbling upon my lesson, but they really stick with me and uh, learn something from, uh, from my lessons. So... Apart from that, let's go beyond CSS, really beyond CSS. What is beyond CSS? Well, for example, one thing that we can do is we can reuse someone else's code. We started doing this. Angelo and Tiago says everything okay here. I'm glad. I'm not going too fast this time, right? Okay, uh, car honked, just confirming that I'm not going too fast. 
Um, so, as you know, developers are lazy. And in fact, Bill Gates even said that he prefers a lazy developers, uh, a lazy developer. I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. That's not completely true. You have to find a lazy developer, but also a smart one, because a lazy, dumb developer will do a mess and will probably do a lot of copy-paste. So yeah, laziness, but smart laziness, okay? And uh, my laziness consists usually of saying, I want to achieve something. For example, I would like to have a CSS drawer on my web page, such as this one here. This is not a drawer, but this website is responsive. And if I see this website on a Galaxy S5, I can see a hamburger icon that I click and I see a drawer. This is some kind of drawer. The drawer is usually something that you see that slides and this is not sliding. This is appearing uh, with a fade effect. But still, I can consider it a drawer with, uh, with multiple, how do you call them? <laughs> I don't know, well, well, multiple lines. And how can I create a drawer? I don't want to create it by myself. And uh, I, I just think that maybe someone could have written a drawer and I can reuse the same code. And I don't know any JavaScript. So is there a, is, is there a pure CSS drawer out there? I ask the mighty Google or DuckDuckGo or Bing or whatever you see fit. And you find that there are people who created some gists of code that you can reuse that implement a drawer in pure CSS. This is a pure CSS transition effect for off canvas view. What does it mean? It means that you see this hamburger icon, this is placed on the left, but with another CSS rule, I can place it on the top or on the right. Let's just keep it on the left. And then if I click on this hamburger icon, ooh, nice effect, nice transition. I can also use another transition like reveal, or I can slide along, or uh, scale up, ooh, or fall in, or push, or bounce. Let's do a bounce. Boing. Okay, it bounced. So all these effects are apparently achieved through a uh, very clever use of CSS and HTML with no JavaScript at all. How did this guy achieve this result? Well, it's a huge hack, but it's widely known uh, as a hack nowadays. Um, it's using a checkbox. You know how to do transitions in CSS, but how do you keep the transition on? How do you keep the drawer open? We saw a transition appearing whenever you hover on an element, but as soon as you stop hovering on an element, well, the transition is, uh, is no more. So how does this guy keep the state of this drawer open or closed? Well, he used a clever, uh, a clever trick, uh, which is using a hidden checkbox with the hidden label. This element here, this hamburger icon here, is actually a label. And it's the label for the checkbox. You remember that if you put the four attributes on a label, you can click on the label and it triggers the event on the checkbox itself, even if the checkbox is hidden. So you don't see the ugly checkbox because it's completely hidden. Or it's not really hidden. As you can see, there's no display none in here. What it does is that it has an absolute positioning of left minus 9,999 pixels and the same goes with top. So the checkbox is not hidden. It's just placed far away from the document so you cannot see it. But if probably if I remove these things here, here's the checkbox. You see it? Little scoundrel. It was just hidden away. It was outside of this document, but it's still there. So this is one of the tricks. You use a label and when you click on the label, you're actually checking and unchecking a hidden checkbox. And then when you click on this label, uh, the checkbox is checked. So you now have 
some uh, probably some selectors on the input type checkbox that were triggered. And let's see, for example, where is the drawer? This is drawer. And that's it. It's, uh, it's a really complex set of rules. It's too complex for us to understand them. But the important part is that we've got this label, a pure toggle label. This is the class, pure toggle label. We've got a pure drawer, which is the drawer that we are drawing. I'm sorry for the pun, no pun intended. And as you can see somewhere, it's written that if the checkbox is checked and we've got a pure drawer element right next to it, you remember the sibling selector, then you want to use this animation name, this animation, and you want it to be visible. If the checkbox is not checked, probably this property, visibility visible, will not be uh, will not be present. It will be overridden by saying no visit, not visible, and the drawer will be not visible anymore. So this is a good combination of having a hidden checkbox, having a label for the checkbox that gets the event and passes it to the checkbox, and this is pure HTML. And then we've got some CSS selectors that say, hey, if the checkbox is checked with this uh, pseudo class on the checkbox, if the checkbox is checked, then the element next to the checkbox, which is the pure drawer, will be visible or not visible with or without an animation, with a special animation or not. And this is how you achieve a pure CSS drawer. But this is one of the many tricks that you can achieve with just CSS. Tricks that are so smart that I would never come up with them in a hundred years, maybe a hundred and one. Uh, for example, uh, there is a website that is you might not need JavaScript. There's also another one which is you might not need jQuery. But I care about this one now. You might not need JavaScript is a cool website that uh, lists a series of amazing widgets that you can add to your website without a line of JavaScript. It's just HTML and CSS. Let's have a look at some of them. Image slider. See this? This is just HTML and CSS. And you can edit this thing on CodePen as I did before. And you can have a look at how it works. And uh, it's just HTML and CSS. There's also a JavaScript panel which is completely empty. So <laughs> it's a uh, Another proof that this is just CSS. Um, this is all about animation, which I don't really care to, to, to explain right now. But um, I, I don't even know how it works. But it just works. And uh, this is not, in, in fact, really a CSS. So I'm not going to tell you anything about this. But still, you can achieve these results. A modal. You click this button and a modal pop-up appears. And you can even click on this to hide the modal again. I'm pretty sure that when you have this uh, state transition between on and off, there's always a checkbox involved. Let's see the code. Is there a checkbox in here? No. There's an element called dialogue that I never saw before. So maybe this is a new thing. Dialogue element HTML. What is a dialogue? It's a dialog box or rather interactive component such as a dismissible alert inspector or sub window. And I never knew this was a thing. Nice. We've got a dialog, which is not available on Internet Explorer and on Safari. So watch out. I recommend you to not use the dialog element if you want your Mac user friends to be able to enjoy your website. Not now. Maybe one day Safari will be able to use dialogues, but I would recommend to use some HTML elements only when every browser, every current browser is able to support that feature of HTML and CSS. So no, I'm not going to use dialogues anytime soon. Not now. View switcher. This is very similar to the slideshow, but now you can switch between different items. How is this achieved without any JavaScript? Let's find out. 
we've got a slider div with some images and we've got a list with different links and these links are using do you remember this? This is the internal link that allows you to switch between different uh, places in the, in the same page and this is something that Sao used uh, in the quotes section if I remember correctly so there's no checkbox in here this is just a clever use of the internal href links and I don't even want to, to, to understand all of this but apparently it works um, I see that there's slide 4, slide 3 maybe do so yeah, slide 1, slide 3, slide 4 this I can tell you by, from experience only works if you know in advance which images you want to show if your images are loaded dynamically from somewhere else if you don't know in advance if you will have four images or five or six you need some JavaScript but if you know in advance which images you want to show and how many this kind of works and you can just use CSS forms I don't care file upload I don't care and validation well well no validation I, I already told you scroll indicator I love this one scroll indicator what does it mean this is a scrollable content and the more I scroll down the more there's this progress bar that it's filling up how is this achieved well a few minutes before starting this lesson I was really curious about it and uh, finally after a while I found out how this is achieved this is another really really clever way of using the same CSS that you already know it's a combination of multiple CSS uh, uh, concepts that I that I explained today and uh, and uh, in the past lesson so we've got a header which is the scroller We've got a main that contains all the H1s and the text uh, that is shown. And then in the CSS, you have the scroller, the header scroller, which is position fixed because you want to keep it always there even if you're scrolling down. So position fixed just fixes the position of the scroller on the top of the document. And, um, and then we've got this body before this is what makes the magic because actually what the scroller does is having a special gradient well the body has a special gradient let me show you what happens if I remove this okay so the body as you can see has a very strange background the background of this body is half one color and half the other color half purplish and half gray and uh, how is this achieved well this is achieved with just a linear gradient but as you can see the gradient is not a real gradient and this is achieved by using this, uh, these amounts in a clever way instead of saying 0% scroller color which will actually do a gradient it's using 50% so actually the gradient starts from uh, one color then at 50% it becomes the same color then at 50% it changes color and at 100% it stays the same color this is what happens with these properties so gradient can be also used not to do actual gradients but also to do some flag-like uh, colors such as start from this color keep it until you reach a point and then start and finish with another color and then the real clever thing is that with this body before with this content and this position and this uh, bottom thing here etc etc well actually what happens is that the body that I had before is completely um, overlapped by a white background so of that flag like background you only see the first stripe and this is what you're seeing here so when I scroll I'm scrolling a background that you remember was a sort of a triangle but I'm just watching I'm just seeing 
a small slice of that triangle. And this is what makes the effect of the scroller bar. I think this is beautiful and I would never come up with this solution. And I don't even think I completely understood it. Maybe there's something that I missed along the way, but I think it's uh, amazing. It's amazing how many cool things you can do with, with just, uh, you know, knowing the rules and applying the rules in a creative way. Uh, there's a very famous... Nope. Uh, oh my, I don't remember the, the name of this. Uh, there's a famous CSS uh, developer. Wasn't that Lea Veru? Yes, Lea Veru is a famous CSS developer that really experimented with uh, many, many tricks that you can achieve with just CSS. Sometimes you also do some, uh, some JavaScript, but it's amazing how cool, how many cool things she was able to achieve with CSS. And she does a lot of uh, also talks uh, about her, um, her findings. And uh, probably some, or even more, uh, of the websites that we used so far could be hers. I don't know if she says that kubikbezier.com is hers or not. Uh, yeah, made by Lea Veru with care. So this website that we used to explain Bezier curves and to use the Bezier curves was made by this amazing CSS developer, Lea Veru. And I really encourage you to have a look at her website and learn from her because she's, she does really cool stuff. You can even create accordions. An accordion is something like this. How do you do that? You go to CodePen and you see how it goes. So, so many things that you can do. Lightbox. Click on Lightbox. Click away from Lightbox. And you can do this by copying their code or by using some frameworks. And this is the, probably the last thing that I'm able to tell you in a very short time. I hope that I would have been able to tell you a little more, but apparently not. CSS frameworks. There are, there's a very important CSS framework called Bootstrap. This is one of the most famous. Bootstrap version 3 was really, really important because it allowed you to place items in a grid-like fashion when there was no Flexbox or CSS Grid available. So probably the, the real fortune of Bootstrap was this uh, grid layout. A grid layout which allowed you to place things into different columns. And it was made by a very clever hack of uh, float left and uh, clear fix, etc, etc. Very similar to what Sao showed us with her work. Uh, she did a two-column layout with float left, and she had to tweak some things in order to make them work. But uh, at a certain point, Flexbox was a, a new thing, and now we don't need uh, Bootstrap's grid layout anymore. We can use it if we want to, but we no don't really need it um, and now Flexbox, well, now we've, we're version 5 of Bootstrap. So we're two versions later. I, I told about Bootstrap 3, which didn't use Flexbox. Then we got Flex, Bootstrap 4, and now we're Bootstrap 5. Bootstrap 5 is definitely use flex, using Flexbox. But still, I don't like the grid system of Bootstrap because it's still using too many tags. In fact, as you can see, you have a container that has rows, and inside of the row, you have multiple columns. With Flexbox only, you don't even need this extra row tag. And the fewer the elements you place on the website, the better. You, always, you should always try to place as, as few elements as possible because of simplicity. You want to keep it simple, the KISS principle. But still, Bootstrap is relevant because it gives you some CSS code that you can use right away and allows you to do a lot of things. It includes reboot, which allows you to, remember, to normalize all the styles that are automatically provided by your browser. So reboot allows you to have a coherent user experience across multiple browsers because it resets any possible rules that are automatically added by the browser. Uh, it adds some uh, good 
typography rules. So a heading one will always be seen like this, a heading two will be seen like this, etc., etc. So it adds some CSS rule that make, uh, rules that make your text look better somehow. And it also adds classes. So you can say that this paragraph behaves as an H1. By adding this custom class that is provided by Bootstrap, you can add this class and Bootstrap will take care of presenting this paragraph as if it was an H1. Uh, you can customize lots of different things, and I cannot go into detail on this, but this is the typography section. Then you have lots of uh, classes that allow you to create responsive images, whatever this means. Uh, I don't know, but probably it means that it's, it allows to stretch or center the image properly inside of its container. Um, you can have a class of image thumbnail, which will probably create an image which is exactly 200 per 200 pixels. And you can make them rounded with just adding the class rounded. So you don't even need to write CSS rules. You just need to know the classes to apply to your tags and Bootstrap will add the proper rules according to the classes that you added. So a rounded class will round the corners of this image. Float start will probably add, uh, add a float left class, uh, float left rule to your image, or a float end will add the floats uh, right. Um, and there's also other other classes that you just need to, you know look at the documentation of Bootstrap and you'll find. If you want a table, the default layout of a table is as good looking as this one. So you don't need to add any rule uh, f to your table. You just need to add a couple of classes. Table of class table will create a nicely looking table. Um, we've got this scope row, which I have no idea what this means. And we've got the call span too, which we already know what this means. It means that Larry the bird is spanning two columns. Uh, you can have multiple variants. So you can have table primary, table secondary, and we'll have different kinds of tables with different colors. And the same goes with cells or rows. In fact, these rows are of different colors because this is the default layout, uh, the default color of the row. But you have colors that are not called blue or red or yellow they have a meaningful name. This is the primary color of your application. This is a secondary color. This is the color in case of success. So you can use it to show successful messages. Hey, everything got right. Or danger, or warning, or informative uh, messages. And all these, um, all these classes are already color coded, but you can customize the color. So if you want your primary color to be purple, you can customize it and then you can use the primary class to say that that element should be purple and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are so many classes to choose from. Oh, there's also a, a dark variant, table dark. I like the dark variant. Uh, there's also a uh, table success, which makes the table green, etc., etc. You can have multiple classes that you can apply to figures, and then you can uh, build beautiful forms. In fact, forms are usually pretty ugly unless you add some CSS. And here you can see a form which is actually much more good looking. It even has some interaction that you can add by just clicking on the input and the focusing on an input as this uh, nice blue border. And you can customize these forms as you wish by just adding some CSS. Um, I cannot go through all the different possible things. There's also some components that you can use out of the box. This component is already provided by Bootstrap. If you need lots of different elements and components and styles that um, should be coherent and consistent, I would really recommend you to use a CSS framework. CSS framework means mostly importing an external CSS from somewhere else. And that is something that we already did. Um, for example, here, I don't know if you remember this, but one time we linked an external CSS into our code base and this automatically normalized every CSS rule that the browser was providing. And with the same 
In the same way, you can import Bootstrap and start using Bootstrap's classes. So you can just start creating class accordings, etc., etc. Um, this is a topic that we should explore a little more. So I'm sorry for those who think that we're going too too slow. But the, less, the next lesson, we will go a little more in detail on using Bootstrap because I think it's pretty important. It's not crucial. It is important, but it's not crucial. In fact, Bootstrap is a huge framework that has lots of different things. But if you only need just a few style rules, then you are still able to create the rules by yourselves. In fact, this is what I did for this website. For this website, I create every rule by myself because I didn't want to import a heavy framework with so many CSS rules that I was not going to use. I wanted to use just a subset of these rules. And instead of copying those, of uh, importing those rules, I created them myself. Maybe copying a little bit from Bootstrap. In fact, some of the, con of the concepts, I completely copied them from Bootstrap. Container as a class is a term that is used by Bootstrap. Uh, probably you already saw it when I showed you the um, grid system. Container. And maybe there's also a fluid container here. Let me just find it. Fluid. Con no, it's not a fluid anymore. Oh, it's container fluid. I'm sorry. There's container fluid in Bootstrap, which is very similar to a container, but container fluid in Bootstrap spans the whole width of the document, while container is not. And this is a concept that I borrowed from Bootstrap. In fact, I have container, which as you can see, has lots of margin on the sides, but I also have fluid container, which has no margin and spans the whole width of the document. So knowing a framework is really important because you can borrow concepts from that. And if you want to use that framework, just use it. Uh, just remember that frameworks are usually bloated with rules and things that can make your website too heavy, especially if it's a very, very easy website. This was an easy website. It's just one page. So I didn't want to include Bootstrap in this web page. This is a much more complex website. And in fact, if I remember correctly, I used a CSS framework, but not Bootstrap. I used Bulma, I think, which is very similar to Bootstrap. The concepts are really, really uh, similar. And it allows you to create a very really easily responsive website with modular components and blah, blah, blah. If you look at the documentation, you will see that in here too, we've got um, some sort of grid system, columns. Here it is. Bulma prefers to use a div of class columns and the div of class columns will have multiple elements of class column. But as you can see, it's pretty much the same. It's just a different naming. But if you don't want to, re to write those three, four CSS properties, you can include Bulma and you have a grid system that is using internally Flexbox. And then also Bulma allows you to have beautiful forms, beautiful components, uh, the same thing as Bootstrap. Look how nice looking these text inputs are. We'll go a little more in detail next time. Now it's 1357, so I don't have the time to show you everything. But still, I'm happy that we are, were able to um, at least show a little bit of, uh, of these frameworks and we will see them a little more in detail next time. Uh, I'm taking the last two minutes here to remind ourselves to do some basic chores every time we do some lesson or some practice. For example, you remember in case of fire, git add, git commit, git push, git tf out. So I'm going to add all the changes to the staging area. I'm going to uh, I don't know, explain advanced concepts on CSS, a commit message which uses the imperative mode. And I'm going to do control enter to create the commit. The commit is created locally. So I also need to push uh, the commit on the remote server by clicking on this button. Or I can do everything from the terminal, of course. I do it every time. I did it last time uh, outside of the scope of the lesson because I forgot to. 
but this is very important to do for me and also for you because when you do this you are no come on yeah confirm please don't don't ask me for okay um because if you do you are building your portfolio and the portfolio is something that you will be able to show to someone else um, I actually care more about the code than the final results. So it's good to upload things to Netlify, but also remember to push everything on GitHub. Uh, I am following the, the few people that uh, gave me their GitHub link. If you can, please tell me your GitHub link. Uh, mine is, well, I've got two because I am ice on fire but I also own the organization called Inglorious Coders. So I usually put everything in here and I can give you this link on Slack. If you do the same, it would be better because this way you can share your, uh, your code with everybody else. You can be followed by everybody else and you can yeah, sh show me the results of your work and I can give you some suggestions, some advice. I'm not going to judge because whatever you do is always much, much better than what I did the first time I saw these things. So you're already better than me. And I think that's it. Uh, please remember to do some exercise to practice and maybe also to share your practice on Slack or with me in any way. Uh, I would love to see the results of your practice. And if you lack motivation, if you, if you don't uh, know where to go, just ask me. I'm always there for you. I really want you to succeed. So please help me help you. With that said, I wish you a happy weekend. Great lesson again. Thanks a lot. See you next week. Angelo, you're so kind. Every time I read your messages, even when I switch off the stream and you're always so kind. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thanks a lot. Have a nice weekend and see you next time for some CSS frameworks. And then we will start JavaScript, which is the important part. Bye, guys.